Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me? Cool. I see Andrew saying, yep. So we're just going to wait a couple of minutes. If you guys were here for the last event, you might have noticed that there's not a waiting room this time, which is good. I solved that issue. You live and you learn from uh, your first time using Zoom. Hope you guys are all keeping well. I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes for a couple of people to join in and then we can get started. So I'm going to actually just go ahead and share my screen. Let's share screen. You guys can see the PowerPoint. Drop a message down um, in the chat if that's a yes. Cool, awesome, thanks guys. So how many people do we have in right now? We had about over 150 people register. So I think some people will be joining later on, but uh, I'll just do some quick intro while, while we have some people here. Let me just full screen this. Has anyone been to a patio recently, actually? actually? Things have started opening back up, eh? It was nice. I went to my first patio on, uh, on Friday down at Oshawa because it was completely empty, and it was a surreal experience. <laughs> I, it just reminded me how much I miss going outside. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of yeses. Yeah, I guess as soon as the uh, restaurants and uh, bars open, the floodgates open as well. As long as we social distance and keep safe, that's what's important. Um, that's good to hear the weather. Yeah, the weather's beautiful, Andrew. Um, yeah, just out of curiosity, guys, just to start some engagement, where are you guys streaming this from? Because with a lot of the in-person events, like people are very limited as to where they can come from. But with these online streams, last time we had people from the States actually stream it. So uh, that was really cool. So we see Mississauga, Toronto, Saga. A lot of GTA, Vaughn, Richmond Hill, Brampton, Windsor. Daniel's down at Windsor. My man, Daniel, he'll be speaking a little bit later on today. Hope you guys are excited. Edmonton, awesome, awesome. So it doesn't look like we have anyone from the States this time, but uh, hopefully next time we can, we, can, we can get a bigger reach as well. Um, so, so guys, actually, in today's event, I wanted to talk a little bit about a market boom and bust cycle. And of course, we're going to have uh, we're going to have Matt Pichet, multimillionaire investor in the Kitchener Waterloo, uh, Cambridge area to be speaking about house flips and also how to raise capital using social media. Matt Pichet has been one of the most influential person in my real estate journey. Like I probably wouldn't be as but going so hard on social media if it wasn't for that guy. Um, so like big shout out to him. I'm very excited. I hope you guys are too. Cause man, like he's definitely changed my entire investing game. And I know he's going to be dropping a lot of knowledge bombs. Um, so have you guys, uh, I, I know there's a lot of kind of um, negative news going on in the world. So let, let's focus on some of the positives. Has anyone had any successes over the past couple of months, whether they bought their first property, bought another property, put in offers? Drop, drop a comment in the chat uh, down there if you want to share some of your successes, whether you placed an offer or bought a property within the last 30 days. Maybe you got rent from your tenants. Um, fortunately for me, I, got, I collected all of my rent from my tenants, so that was good. Um, so no missed payments in the month of June. Hopefully, we can hope, I can hope for the same in July. Um, also, hat closing on a couple of deals. So I just, just being a bit more wary on making offers just because of course there's a lot of uncertainty now so your reward has to justify the risk so we see daniel he's got a wholesale deal closing in july daniel daniel you're absolutely crushing it dude this guy actually retired his job at what 27 or 28 so like he's hustling hard now um he's going to be speaking on uh, later on in the event as well just on i've been searching for houses in windsor the market's wild there right now 100% agree. The market is absolutely nuts. I've been seeing fixer uppers there go for 260K, whereas before it probably would have went for 200K. So the market's been a bit crazy there. Uh, 
Catherine bought a second property in Windsor, got all the rents from the tenants. Reno's going well on the first Windsor property. That's huge. Congratulations on that. I love seeing you guys taking action. Jason got a house in Scarborough. I actually want to get a house in Scarborough soon as well, like a bungalow conversion. So congratulations to you on that. Scarborough is a great market. Um, John closed on a triplex in Moncton today, also closed on a duplex during COVID. Main floor rented out, reno on the basement, all happening now. Looking for the next deal. Let's go. All, all rents paid too. That's awesome, dude. I've been actually eyeing on the Moncton markets as well. Um, just because in Ontario, things are not really in favor of the, the landlord. It's, it's really tenant favorable. And I know that in Moncton, the, the landlord and the tenants kind of have rights. So it's a more balanced market in that sense. Um, but yeah, as we wait for more people to jump on, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Again, this is going to be very content heavy. So if any of you guys kind of miss out on what's going on, don't worry about it. Everything's being recorded. This is all going to go on YouTube. Um, so no, no worries at all. So maybe I should uh, just jump into it. Let's see the time actually now. 7.35. Yeah, so I guess I'll get started with the event. Um, so starting off again, for, for people just tuning in, uh, don't be alarmed. Matt Pichet will be jumping on at eight o'clock today to be presenting about flips and how to raise capital using social media. But until then, you guys have to listen to me. So deal with it. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about real estate bubbles and we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of it. So a big part of what I like to do as a real estate investor that I guess differentiates me from a lot of other investors is that I like to look at the fundamentals and the concepts that drive the real estate market and the overall economy. Um, I think a lot of investors kind of get boggled down into the strategies of real estate, but you got to take a step back and look at the overall picture as well. And one of these things is understanding what a real estate bubble is. So a real estate bubble, as we see on the screen, it is a property bubble or it's an economic bubble that occurs in local or global real estate markets and it follows a land boom. A land boom, that's the rapid increase in market price of a property uh, that reaches unsustainable levels and decline. So one thing I do wanna make clear is, is that real estate is an investment. Just like any other investment, it moves in cycles. Real estate is not immune to crashes. It's not immune to boom cycles. It moves up and down, just like the stock market, just like any other investment. And over the past 10 plus years, Canadian real estate has been going on an insane appreciation spree. We've seen housing prices increase at an unprecedented pace, especially in Toronto. We all know we all know the story of Toronto, the unaffordability down there. It's, a, it's, it's pretty crazy in Toronto. Um, but yeah, like real estate is absolutely nuts right now. And then we do need to prepare for when it does slow down and the music will stop. It's just a matter of when. No one knows the magnitude of how much it's going to decrease by, but it, but it is going to have a slowdown eventually. Um, and, and when that does happen, we need to be prepared for that. We need to invest on cash flow, not on speculation. Um, so by the way, guys, make sure to drop any questions you have in the group chat. Uh, I'm just going to be breezing through some of this information. Then we'll have Matt Pichet on to give you the stuff that you really want to hear. Um, so we're going to be talking about an impact of a bubble. So a real estate bubble. Bubbles in the housing markets are more critical than stock market bubbles. And housing price bursts are less frequent than stock market bursts. But they have twice the impact on GDP and they last twice as long. And the reason for this is because a lot of our country's economy is tied into real estate. In Canada, I think the overall GDP, about 12 to 14% is tied into the real estate market. So we know if real estate, real estate takes a hit, you're going to be having a lot of job losses. Um, the overall fundamentals of Canada are going to get hit pretty heavy as well. The average stock market bubble crash, or sorry, the average stock market crash leads to about a 4% decrease in GDP on average, but real estate, we're looking at it 8%. So that's double the shock. Um, real estate definitely has some more drastic impact from the stock market when shit goes wrong. Um, housing market indicators. So how do we know that we're in a bubble or whether things are, are fine? Um, well, no one really knows, right? And hindsight's always a 2020 tool. No one has a crystal ball, but we can use educated guesses and we can use indicators out there in the industry. These are what economists use. These are what professionals use to kind of determine the insight as to whether they think a real estate market is overpriced or not. And one of the things that they actually end up doing is, is to compare 
pre, they, they have like a list of metrics and they see how the metrics are now versus prior to uh, prior. So like when the metrics were in unsustainable levels, uh, that's kind of the benchmark where we know that once it hits that level, things are probably going to end up tailing off or, or where we're in a quote unquote bubble. Uh, there are two types of indicators that a lot of economists and a real estate investor should be looking at. The first one is your valuation component. And the second one is your debt component. I know guys, this is very content heavy, but uh, I think it's very important for investors to understand this. And uh, again, Matt Pichet will be talking about the strategies in real estate, but I do want to talk about the fundamentals a little bit before we get into that. Um, some of the metrics to determine whether or not we're in a housing bubble. Uh, the first thing that we can take a look at is housing affordability metrics or valuation metrics. So these things, the, this is like the median multiple. So we see the first formula here. That's your median house price divided by your median household income. So what this really tells you is the affordability of a market. So on average, a rule of thumb, and again, this is just a rule of thumb. If you're making 100K in income, you're probably going to be able to qualify for a $500,000 mortgage. Whatever your income is, multiply that by five. And as a really rough rule of thumb, that is likely your maximum mortgage qualification. So we know that five times is the maximum mortgage qualification, but in cities like Toronto, where we're seeing million dollar houses, if the average median household income is about $100,000 or so, how are people qualifying for these million dollar houses, right? That's kind of an idea that we know we're in a bubble um, when affordability becomes such a huge issue that locals cannot afford it. Um, also another metric that we can take a look at to determine whether we're in a real estate bubble or not is your deposit to your income ratio. So that's your median down payment divided by your median household income. And lastly, you can take a look at your price to income ratio. Uh, that's, your median house, that's your median house price divided by your median disposable income. So the price to income ratio is almost the exact same thing as your median multiple. Uh, the only difference is we're dividing it by the median household disposable income. All disposable income is, is that it's your after tax household income, okay? After tax, how much is your household bringing in? Um, that's your median disposable income. And you guys might be asking yourself, how do I know what's the right number to determine whether a market's overvalued or not? Knowing the number alone is not going to do anything. You have to see the trend. So if we've seen previous market crashes where it hit a particular level and then it leveled off, we kind of have an idea of what's considered overvalued. Um, also, there's housing debt metrics, right? So we see here the two major ones are your debt to income level. So that's your monthly mortgage payment divided by your disposable income. And lastly, your debt to equity level. So that is fairly straightforward. That's your loan to value. So what's the average loan to value for Canadians? Um, the lower the loan to value, that means the less debt Canadians have in their household. And obviously, that's a better thing. Um, and lastly, this is probably the most important things as investor is seeing how house prices correlate to rental income. So in the US in specific, we've seen in 1984 to 2013, prices were increasing by about 3% every single year. But in 1997 to 2002, we saw house prices actually, we saw house prices increase by 6%. So if rent is increasing by 3% and house prices are significantly outpacing that, that is indication that it, there's a high chance that the, um, or not a high chance, there's a possibility that the housing market is overvalued. And the reason for that is, is because you're disconnecting from fundamentals, cash flows to fundamental. But if your house prices are much higher than the rent and the income you're able to generate, that's going to be a huge is issue for investors. And then also there's their ownership ratio, which is just telling you how many people own houses versus how many people who do not own houses in the area. Instead, they rent. Um, obviously, that's very, very uh, deter that's determined by your income. So if you have a higher income, your ownership ratio of a particular country should be higher. Um, however, if the income levels are kind of the same, which we've been seeing in some cities, income not really changing, but we we've been seeing ownerships rise that's probably because your interest rates have decreased. And if your interest rates decrease, housing becomes more affordable. And lastly, there's the house, the house price to earnings ratio. Um, what that is, is in the stock market, there's something called the price to earnings ratio. And that's, kind, that's one of the ways to kind of determine the value of a stock. In real estate, 
the price to earnings ratio is actually called the house price to earnings ratio. And in simplicity, it's your house price divided by your cash flow. And basically what it tells you for every dollar of cash flow that you're getting from the property, how much are you paying in house price? The lower that ratio, the better, right? But the higher that ratio, that means for every dollar of cash flow, uh, for every dollar of cash flow you're getting, you're paying more in the house price, which is obviously not a good thing. Um, so is there any, any questions so far? Is this all kind of making sense, guys? I know it's pretty content heavy. Don't worry, we're gonna get into the real estate strategies in a couple of minutes. Um, but I think this is very important for investors. So um, any, any questions so far, guys? Are we all good? Looks like, uh, it looks like we're all good. So while well, I'll continue just digging through this, um, we're gonna get into some interesting stuff very soon. So there's something called a house price index. In the stock market, we follow like the S&P 500. We, we follow different indexes, but there's also an indexes in the real estate market as well. And that helps determine whether uh, the stock, whether, sorry, the real estate market's overvalued or not. So what, a what is a house price index? It looks at the value of a house and how it changes over time. The same house. So my house today, if I picked it up for 100K two years ago, and next year it sells for 200K, it will measure that change because it's the same house. It measures the same house and the sold data over time. Okay, so that's how it kind of removes all of the noise by looking at the same asset over a period of time. You can find this data in National Bank. You can find it in the Canadian Real Estate Association and Stats Canada. Uh, if we're looking for Canadian data on house price index, those are the places where it's published. In the United States, there is something very popular to determine whether the um, housing market is overvalued in or not. And that is called, that is called the Case Shiller Home Price Index. And that was actually created by a Nobel Prize winning economist. So very smart guy came up with this metric. And you're going to take a look. I'm going to actually walk you through kind of what we've seen in the 2008 recession in the States and how this is applicable to Canada as well. Um, so the Case Shiller Home Price Index, what it does is, is it looks at the same house and how it's sold over a period of time. So again, there's not much noise that drowns out the data, right? It's not like if more luxury houses, sell, like the average home price is very skewed. If more luxury houses sell, your average home price is going to increase. This is why I like personally looking at house prices index because we don't have any of that to skew the data. Anyways. Um, so what it does is it looks at the same houses being sold over a period of time. It uses a three month moving average. And in the USA, what they end up doing is they take the year 2000 and what house prices were in the 2000 and that's the benchmark. So what the case Schiller home price index says is that if, if the house prices increase over the benchmark uh, price, which is in the year 2000, house prices in the 2000, if house prices increase from that af after being inflation adjusted, then it expects the house prices to go back down to the 2000 level. So I'll, I'll show you exactly what I mean in this particular graph here. So this is uh, real data, uh, real US data of the Case Shiller Index. 1890 was the benchmark and this is inflation adjusted, okay? Uh, I'm going to show you a newer chart in the next slide. So this is a newer chart, but uh, we're going to go through the old data first. So 1890 used to be the benchmark. So we can see here in 1890, the index is at 100 because that's the benchmark, right? That's what we're comparing all of the home prices to. And then we see as the years change, we see a dip and increase, a dip, increase, but it always reverts back to the medium of 100 the median of 100, and this is called mean reversion. It's a concept in statistics, and it's very popular in finance. And it's a concept that kind of says that if things move away from the norm, eventually over time, it'll start going back to the norm. So that's the entire concept of the case Shiller Index. So we can see that prices are actually going nuts leading up to the recession in 2007, and it is way above the benchmark of 1890. Then what do we see happen? We see home prices take a huge, or we see the case Shiller index take a huge dip going back to the norm, right? So if we look at the more recent data, uh, so now in the US, they use the year 2000 as the benchmark. That's the new benchmark for the case Shiller index. So how do we read this graph? I know there's a lot of data here. Um, apologies if you guys find this boring, but uh, 
I'm a guy that loves, uh, loves real estate education. So I kind of like to dig down on concepts that are not talked about uh, very often in the real estate community. Um, so anyways, yeah, if we take a look at the case Shiller index in this case, and again, we're using us data again, because uh, it's, it's more available in the States than in Canada, we can see the year 2000 is the benchmark, right? So we see the index is at a hundred percent and then we see uh, it starts increasing. So uh, just a quick, just a quick uh, guideline. These lines here, they're not inflation adjusted. The dotted lines are inflation adjusted composite 10. I, if I remember correctly, I think composite 10 is seeing the home prices change over time for the 10 biggest city in the US. Composite 20, we're looking at the 20 biggest cities in the USA. And uh, national, we're just looking at, I believe it's the, national, the entire, uh, ent all, all the cities in the US. Did I say countries or cities? <laughs> the national looks at all of the cities or, or states. I'm sorry, I'm just mixing things up. Like I am, I'm super tired. I had a long day at work. But the national... The national U.S. looks at all of the states in the U.S. and builds the index out. So again, composite 10, 10 biggest states, composite 20, 20 biggest states, national U.S., all of the states in the U.S. So if we take a look at the inflation adjusted one, because that's probably what's more important, right, after inflation. Um, so we can see that in the year 2000, that's the benchmark that was at 100. Then, of course, things started going crazy leading up to 2007 and 2008, because there was a huge huge bull market in the states people were literally buying houses and trying to sell them in the next month or two so the u.s got in a huge mortgage crisis right real estate was seen as a completely risk-free asset which we know no investment is risk-free anyone who tells you otherwise you got to second question the mo you got to second question their motives no investment is risk-free the stock market isn't real estate isn't but in the u.s they were treating like real estate was risk-free so we saw that people were being very speculative and buying real estate assets up assets up left, right, and center. So there's been a huge increase, a huge increase from the norm in 2000. So we saw house prices touch almost 200% of the benchmark rate by the year 2007, 2008. And then we all know what happened, it's history. Um, the mortgage bubble burst, and then we saw a huge dip in, in, in housing prices using the Case-Shiller Index. And actually it reverted back to the median in the year 2000. So uh, again, remember 2000 is the benchmark and we see in 2012, pretty much when we're looking at the national US level and the 20 biggest states in the, in the US, uh, based on the case Schiller index, we're back at the benchmark level of 100 at the same level of 2000 after being adjusted for inflation. When we're looking at the top 10 biggest states in the US, um, it didn't necessarily go back to the same level in the 2000 but it's getting close. It's about 110%. So it's only a 10% increase from the 2000, uh, the, the levels in the 2000. So we can see that the concept of mean reversion is actually very interesting. Um, and seeing how it impacts the real estate market is also something we should definitely be looking into as well. Uh, again, this is the data that they use in the States. I don't have the Canadian data readily available right now. I'm hoping for the next meeting, we can quickly just dive into that a bit more. Um, but you guys do have the tool and the skill sets here. Like I, although I quickly glanced over the concepts on what makes a real estate bubble, what metrics you should look at. Of course, the Case Shiller Index, which was created by, again, a Nobel uh, Prize winning economist. Um, since you guys have these concepts at your, at your disposal, I suggest uh, when you guys get off of this call, whenever that may be, to, to go back and really dig down in these concepts and solidify it and see how it applies to Canadian real estate. To be a truly, I guess, all around investor, you need to understand these concepts and be able to apply them. Um, of course, so you can make a risk adjusted decision as well. But uh, hope you guys found this useful. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to, what time is it now? So it's about 7.50, Matt Pichet should be on. But before we pass it on to Matt Pichet, I just want to give it to my man, Daniel, um, who's out actually also a co-host of this event. And this guy's been absolutely crushing it in real estate. Guy retired from his full-time job. Dude, it looks like you also lost a lot of weight too. So you're taking the health and fitness very seriously. I love that, man. So uh, yeah, like why don't you share a bit about your story and tell them the importance of mindset, right? Because all of this data stuff that I just spoke about, although it's important, it means nothing if you don't have the right mindset. So why don't you jump into that a bit? Yeah, you got that right, Austin. Uh, I hope you guys are doing well. Um, that was a great talk, by the way, Austin. I absolutely love the fact that you touch on things that people don't popularly 
popularity is that even a word people don't usually talk about and so it's really really good because that at the end of the day like any information that we can uh, understand about the market understand about our approach to real estate investing is super helpful so i tip my hat to you man keep continue growing because we need it so but as far as myself man uh things have been well uh one thing i want to encourage you guys with is that although we're learning a lot of information i actually wanted to talk on mindset a lot because i think it's really really important that what really helped me, I share because uh, if, if, if I've had any results, I would love to uh, be of value to you guys. And so uh, in the beginning, when I first started, you know, what my, my original thought about mindset, I used to think is just this emotional thing. I used to think it was just motivation. It's just really to get people pumped up and excited to go, but didn't really have any value. It was like filling up empty space with a bunch of fluff because, you know, there's not enough real tactical value, you know? And so... Well, what really changed my mindset one day was uh, I actually heard this speaker, this, uh, other, this uh, more famous real estate investor, and he was on the stage and he said, if I give two people the same information that have the same income, that come from the same demographic and have the same keys to success, but only one of them achieves their goals and the other does not, why is that? And the reality is, is it's not because of the, not because of the content, because the content's the same. It's not because of the income. It's not because of the demographic, because they're in the same place. It's because of the person and their mindset. And that really helped shift what I thought about mindset. Um, really, the, uh, for this call tonight, for example, hearing from Austin, hearing from myself, and eventually hearing from Matt Pichet, you will get a ton of golden nuggets. You'll get a lot of information that is applicable and applicable to applicable. Well, I'm making up words today. It is very applicable to your situation, right? However, the difference between you and everybody else on this call are those who apply it using their mindset, right? People will go through life pointing the finger. They'll point it and saying that I don't have the secret to success, to success that it's the government's fault, that it's my parents who didn't set me up for success. But here's one thing that's really important. As long as you continue to blame others, it will depend on others to change the situation. But when you start to take responsibility for where you are in life, it is then when you have the power to change it. Think about it. The moment you start taking responsibility, it may not be your fault. I'm not saying whatever happened to you, whatever happened in life, whatever brought you to this point is your fault. But if you take responsibility for it, it is at that point when you will be able to change your situation. So think of it this way. I am convinced that everybody knows what it, what it takes to be successful. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced. Like nobody can tell me different. I am sold on the fact that it really, it really comes down to that the far majority are unwilling to do the work. That's just it. I'm telling you, it, you can apply this to sports, you can apply this to business, real estate investing, raising kids, no matter what. If you are just determined that you are going to get it done no matter what, I'm telling you at some point, it's not a matter of if, it's just when you'll succeed, right? And so it's not a talent issue. It's not a, it's not a knowledge issue. It's just a mindset issue. It's a perspective. How do you shift your, your paradigm to be able to see that you actually have the capabilities to get things done, right? And so... Uh, I don't want to take too much uh, time because I do want Matt Pichet to come on. But for those who don't know, I want to go over a quick view of how I was able to do my first deal. Because even though I got a deal closing next month and I've had a few more, I've done a few more deals, I've done a flip. I want to explain that the process of doing my last deal was no different from doing my first deal. When I did my first wholesale deal, this deal came through a Kijiji lead. This was a free ad that I put up online. It didn't cost me any money, but it didn't, but the seller didn't hit my ad after the first day. I was putting up Kijiji ads twice every day. I was deleting the ad, putting them back up twice every day. And I was doing that for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. I was doing it when I first got to work. And then uh, during my lunch break, I would repost again. And sometimes when I got home, I would repost again, three times, right? And I wouldn't get anything. Most of the time I would get like copy and pasted messages from contractors, painters, from realtors, you know, those typical like, you know, uh, copy that you'd get in your, uh, from your, in your Kijiji messages, right? But I still kept going. I still kept doing it. Eventually, someone, uh, someone posted, uh, somebody messaged me who was, actually, who was an actual seller who wanted to sell their home. And what was amazing about it was this person didn't post their house on Kijiji. They didn't list their ad. They actually looked for my ad and, and, and messaged me. And so it just goes to show just right there, being consistent. You never know when somebody's actually going to be willing to sell. And that's just one marketing strategy, right? I went to the house. I took pictures, I built rapport, but then I left. Like I didn't even go there and negotiate at the table, get a contract and walk away. Cause once again, it was my first deal. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought you just take pictures and then you go home and then you call them and negotiate a price. But even then 
I didn't understand how to evaluate homes. So I relied on people who I met in my, net, in my network from going to networking events. Hey, I have a house here in Oshawa. This is the, this is, uh, the, seller, uh, this is the seller situation. What price do I need to get it at in order to get it sold? And then I called, the, I called the homeowner. I negotiated a price. I ended up getting it at a price that works. But then I, it was also a verbal agreement. I didn't even know how to fill out a contract. I've never seen a real estate contract at that time. And yet, once again, I, I figured it out. This is not knowledge. This isn't about talent. This is just how hard are you willing to work and how consistent are you willing to keep at it in order to get it, right? And so I ended up getting the contract done. But even the next stage, I have to get a lawyer to get a real estate transaction done. Guess who didn't have a lawyer? I had to go find one, right? Like there were so many things I didn't know. But once again, when you try to take real estate like the same way you would drive, like that's how you get things done. You may hit traffic. You may even have to wait to pass a car accident. There may be things that can hold you up, but eventually if you keep your foot on the gas, you will get to your destination. But a lot of times we take real estate investing as if we won't get in the car until all the lights on the streets are green. That's just not realistic. You're not going to know everything back and front and things are going to go perfect. But if you can just take the punches, take the consistency, stay disciplined and keep going, you will get there. And so taking that, taking that approach is the real key to success. No matter what it is you don't know today, you will find out tomorrow as long as you put in the work. Be showing up to this call and listening to Austin, listening, listening to Matt Pichet. You will continue to grow as an investor coupled with that mindset your success is inevitable. And so I just want to encourage you, you all have the ability to accomplish your goals. Every single one of you, it just depends on your ability to keep going. Just keep going. Even if during COVID it's been tough, it's been slowed down for you because you haven't really had much action. Listen, the opportunity, as long as you're alive, there are opportunities for you for you to continue to push forward. And so I wish nothing for the best for you guys. And I look forward to hearing from Matt Pichet. So Having said that, I would love to uh, introduce my man, Matt Pichet. Uh, so uh, for those who don't know, Matt Pichet, he's a killer multimillionaire real estate investor. Super awesome dude. I watched, binged watched a ton of his videos uh, starting out when I was uh, looking at real estate, watching how he was from the beginning to where he is now. He's grown exponentially. And it's an honor to introduce you and super excited to see what you have to share with us today. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Can you hear me? Everybody's good? All good, man. Can you hear Audio me? good? Sweet. Yeah. Third. All right, man. So I can get right into it. <laughs> get right into it, man. I'm All right, man. <laughs> so I'll share my screen here. Got to figure out how to do this real quick. All right, everybody can see my screen. Yes, sir. All right. So I can't see the chat. So for all you guys, feel free to chat away. So ask questions. I'll just ask for Dan and Austin to just shout out whatever question you guys have, and I'll just answer from there. If that's cool. Yep, that works. Awesome. All right, guys, so we got a lot to cover today. I got actually three presentation. Austin asked me to bring the value, so I'm giving you guys everything. So I'll be talking first about Kitchen Waterloo for a quick little bit, then I'll get into how to flip houses in 30 days, and then we'll get into the secret sauce, the JV attraction, how to raise all the money you will ever need. So good to go. All right, Kitchen Waterloo. So population is 540,000. I think we're actually pushing closer to 600,000. So just in case, if you guys don't know where Kitchen Waterloo is or how big it is, we're a pretty decent sized city. There's lots going on, lots of opportunities. So that's really important when we're investing in real estate. One of the biggest things that's going on right now is technology triangle. That's what everybody's calling Kitchener. We're the mini Seattle apparently. So lots of buzz around the technology sector, which I'll get into more in a bit. But the benefits for that is means that a lot of capital is coming to Kitchener. The university programs are expanding, which is great to, to give more professionals in the market and attracting more capital and more professionals from all over the world to literally move and live in Kitchener. So right downtown where, Goop, where the headquarters is, um, there's a lot going on there money-wise. There's a lot of new buildings, a lot of new uh, skyscrapers, like literally for Kitchener, <laughs> that's pretty huge. And a lot of more businesses coming to downtown sector, which is cool. Because downtown, uh, I've lived here for like pretty much my whole life. Downtown like five years ago, guys, was like a no-go. You just didn't go to downtown Kitchener. Now it's looking like a mini Toronto, which is really, really cool. So even though with all the tech, buzz a lot of people don't know but the majority of our of our workers are actually in the manufacturing and trade section of uh jobs so like 40 percent of our workers actually work in factories or manufacturing or trade because we're right along the 401 we're super close to milton toronto hamilton london we're right in that secret little stop there so there's a lot of jobs revolved around that we also have a huge education sector so we have a lot of uh, colleges universities university of waterloo laurier Conestoga college 
There's a lot going on and a lot of jobs revolving around that as well. So the biggest thing, what does this all mean? It means we have a very, very diverse industry, which is what I really look for. I want boring, 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 and predictable. So when I have tenants who can find a lot of jobs, that's what I'm looking for. So if we look back to 2008, like Austin was just going over in Kitchener-Waterloo, literally nothing happened, like at all. There was a little bit of scare going on, but like, that's it. And even right now with the whole COVID thing, we had like two weeks of people kind of holding back, seeing what was going to happen. Literally COVID lasted two weeks. There is no more COVID, <laughs> real estate wise. Things are just picking up. And the main reason is because we have a super, super diverse industry. So if manufacturing goes under or the automobile industry gets hit from a recession, the other industries pick up the load and still provide a lot of jobs. Again, just things that I really look for. We also have super, super consistent and strong appreciation basing off of that diverse industries, lots of jobs, lots of tenants working. They can pay rent and pay higher and higher rents. So the appreciation factor for that is really good because real estate is always in demand. And like I said, we have very, very strong industries to weather economic storms should they come. Transportation, this was something that was lacking a lot in Kitchener. Like I said, like five years ago when Kitchener was very, very small compared to what it is now. Uh, they're changing a lot of the GO trains to Toronto. So for example, even two years ago, we only had one train per day in the morning and one train per day at night going to and coming from Toronto. Uh, now we're up to about four trains a day. And in two years from now, there'll be eight trains a day. So there's a lot going on. And then also with the light rapid transit, we can see on the left here, the blue little bus <laughs> that just came into Kitchener about a year and a half ago, which is really, really cool because it connects all the cities, Waterloo, Kitchener. And in two years, they're going to build the Cambridge section. So all cities will be together. So you can get from one city to the other very, very quickly. Again, this doesn't really matter for us, especially if we're, uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about this because in Kitchener, it's a little different than Toronto or like Hamilton where it's more trendy, more downtown. In Kitchener, people still like to drive their cars. So tenant wise, it doesn't really matter how close you are to an LRT stop, which everybody kind of freaks out about. Real estate wise, it's good. But honestly, in terms of rents or your tenants, they don't really care about the LRT because if your tenants are paying, I don't know, 1400, 1500 bucks a month or more, they're driving cars. They own cars. They're not taking the LRT. Maybe in 10 years from now, we'll be cool like Toronto, but right now people like to drive their cars. But anyway, we want to invest near the LRT just for the appreciation of real estate. We also have a very, very strong pool of tenants. We have lots of jobs. Like I said, super easy to fill properties. We're filling our properties right now uh, with tenants, like literally within one to two weeks. If your properties look like the free flow investor properties, which we'll talk about here on how to renovate them, they're honestly getting rented super, super fast. And that's, that's really great for us. The rents are getting higher and higher, more in demand. Like I said, we have all those strong industries, lots of working tenants, which is what we want. When our tenants work, they pay rent. When they pay rent, we make money. So that's super, super important. And what I really look for, touching on education again, we have top universities in Canada, right here, uh, U of W and Laurier, those are top universities right in this city and a top college, Conestoga College, where I actually went to for my apprenticeship program as a carpenter. So the Conestoga College is more trade-based, I would say, in Waterloo. So we have a big uh, school for that, which is really good. So in a nutshell, lots of opportunities for student properties or just more people moving to Kitchener-Waterloo. Last but not least, we have the quality. I'm all about quality. If you guys follow me, you know that. I don't really buy crappy real estate. Doesn't mean you shouldn't, but I, I, I focus for me on quality because I want boring, simple, high quality tenants. That's what I'm after. So I have lots of professionals. And as I said, diverse industries. I keep hitting on that because that's what I care about. Super, super important. And we have quality tenants who pay. All right, you guys ready for the flipping? I went through that real quick. Are you guys excited? Put in the chat box. I got to drink some water here. <laughs> all right. Flipping a real estate in 30 days. So if you guys follow me, you guys know I love flipping houses. That's kind of the section that I'm at in my business right now. I'm really focused on growing the flipping business because we have the wealth side of the business uh, down pat for me. I'm actually kind of slowing down on buying buying holes. I feel like I have enough of those, which is great. Doesn't mean I won't buy more because I still am. I got offers going in tomorrow on some. That's just how it is. But I'm really focusing for me more on the flips now. We got the wealth side built on our personal business. Now we want the cash, the active income. And I'll talk about when we should do this in your business as well. So how many of you guys are flipping actively? Can you put in the chat? And actively, I would say two or three flips a year. That's what I consider an active flipper. Dan or Austin, can you tell me how many people are answering yes to that question? How many of you are actively flipping real estate? Guys, drop. Oh, yes. We have one yes. 
One. Let's keep it going. A flip, a flip to yourself or no? Is I'll take it. I'll take it. Shit. Burrs and Hell straight yeah, flips. I should be seeing a lot of yas in this. Yeah, show. man. Let's go. Let's go. Come How on, many of you are doing that? Yeah, we have people burn. Got another one. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Gary's actively flipping. Yep. So all you guys actively flipping or burring, how many of you guys look like this dude right here? <laughs> you're looking for properties on the laptop. You're taking all the phone calls from the contractors. You're calculating everything. You're calculating all the budgets. You're running to the properties, dropping off all the materials. Comment again. Who of you are doing that? You're doing everything right now. I got to know who's doing all this. Because this is where I was too, man. Like when I started... Uh, at the very beginning, I, I was doing everything, right? It was only recently that I started to change that. And we'll talk about how we changed that. Terry said that was half his life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If you guys want to do this for real and build a real business, it's got to be on autopilot and it's got to have a system. So what you got to do is build a team, build a rental system, build a brand. We're going to talk a lot about branding in the second session here. Get that money and be the CEO of your business, which means... For you guys as real estate investors, your main focus honestly needs to be solely closing deals and raising money. That should literally be all you're doing and the marketing as well, which we'll get into. But I know everybody's doing everything right now or the majority of people are. You're ordering the materials, you're doing this, you're doing that, and you're trying to find deals, close deals, you're doing everything. And when you do that, you're just not gonna scale and grow your business. I know you have to at the beginning, but you wanna work towards being the CEO and only focusing on those two things, raising money, closing deals. That's it. That's your job. So why listen to me before I get into the good stuff? If you don't know me, if you don't follow me on YouTube or Instagram or whatever, I bought my first property at 22 years old. Uh, I'm now 31 just for, a, I don't know, something there. <laughs> Scale, I guess. Uh, I now have 35 properties worth over $10 million in real estate. We're selling a lot of properties off this year. Uh, about eight or 10 properties this year we're selling off because I'm kind of what I call like in the second stage of my real estate investing career where I built a lot of the wealth. Now we're selling off one of the, or some of the older ones, some of the ones with the biggest juice in them. I'm selling them, cashing out. And what I'm doing, which we'll talk about maybe later, is I'm private lending all those profits immediately. Literally, as soon as the money comes in from those deals, I'm sending it right back out, private lending for that real passive money. No tenants, no toilets, no nothing. That's just what I'm doing for my business. And we can talk about that a little more later. I've raised well over $20 million in funds. You're gonna find out pretty soon exactly how I did that. And just in case you didn't know, I'm also still a full-time realtor specializing solely with real estate investors here in Kitchener Waterloo. So if you're investing in Kitchener Waterloo, definitely hit me up because from as far as I know, I'm literally the only realtor here solely focusing on investing. 100% of my sales are investment properties, no joke. I ain't selling the home with the white picket fence. <laughs> <laughs> So going back to building a power team, these are the people that you really desperately need on your team. Number one, you got wholesalers, you got realtors. I'm going to say that's the most important one. We'll talk about that. We got the home stagers, the insurance brokers, and the contractors. Now, there's a lot more, obviously, accountants, bookkeepers, et cetera. But these five, I would say, are your literally your power team, the most important ones. Wholesalers are pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to expand on that. Basically, it's people who find off-market deals. They sign a contract. And you, I'm sure you've seen all the We Buy Houses websites or the ads or whatever. You're probably on a bunch of lists. Those are great guys and girls to have on your team because they're finding the real deals on your market value. Talk about the real deals real quick. <laughs> so I still buy a ton of deals off the MLS for buy and holds because I'm looking for very specific properties and you can still make a ton of money, even right now, off of the MLS. If we're doing flipping, because right now we're talking about flipping, most of the time in Southwestern Ontario and pretty much all of North America right now, you need to get a real deal for a flip. It has to be under value and you ain't going to find it off the MLS. Not right now. So the flip deal has got to be way under market value. So the wholesalers are really good for this. So number two, the investment savvy realtor. It should look a little bit like this guy. Wink, wink. No, I'm kidding. All right. <laughs> so if you work with a realtor, you want to make sure they actually invest in real estate themselves. Again, you can't be working with the Joe Blow or the Jane Blow, I don't know, realtors who just sell normal real estate with a white picket fence and they sell a couple of rental properties here, but they also work with the regular Joe buyer. It ain't gonna happen. You have to go to a specialist. Would you go to a foot doctor to fix your hand? I don't know if that was a good example, but no, you wouldn't. You go to the foot doctor to fit your foot. This is the exact same thing when it comes to investing in real estate. I'm telling you, the most important team member is literally a realtor who focuses solely or primarily on real estate investing themselves and they have to invest themselves as well. 
side note of that, what should dictate a good uh, a number of properties that they should have? I always say your realtor should have a minimum of 10 properties themselves. Now, why do we want our realtor to have that many properties? It means they're obsessed, they're crazy, which is good, <laughs> and they're all stars. They know exactly what they're doing. If somebody owns 10 properties or more, they have the systems built, probably. They probably have a good team of contractors, a good team of lawyers, mortgage brokers. They've been through the ringer. And when you work with these realtors, for example, if you work with me, when I help you buy a property, you get all of my team for free. Like I, I'm going to hold your hand and bring you through the whole thing. So that's what you want. The Jane Blow or the Joe Blow realtors, they don't have that, okay? They will also understand your business model, what you're after. They can help you list the property even if you flip it maybe even cheaper because if you're bringing the realtor more and more flips, if you're flipping one deal a month, you know, one deal every couple months and they're listing all those properties for you, I bet you they're going to give you a discount. I'm not going to tell people that too loud, but I give my guys discounts who sell a lot of properties with me and they may also come across good deals as well. You never know. Before you jump forward, yeah. I, I do want, I a hundred percent agree with that. So if anyone knows my story, you know, my first realtor I ever worked with the not invest in investment properties and how screwed over I got yeah, totally. after that experience. So definitely do find someone um, who does own investment properties, right? Because as Matt was saying, they're obsessed. They already have the team. A lot of people try to build their team from scratch, man. Like if you have a realtor that works with investors, they have the team for you to leverage. You're not building it from scratch. Exactly. We also have a quick question in the chat before we move forward yep. and it was from David. So why do you sell the property and lend it rather than sell the property with the BTB? So I guess you private money into the BTB. Yeah. Right? Good question. Could totally do that. Uh, I just haven't come across an opportunity like that yet for me. It, I don't know. It's just my personal preference. I, I want to sell it cash out and just private lend all of it to fellow flippers that I know and trust really well. Other investors in my circle that I trust it's working out really well. That's just the route I'm taking, but that's a great option as well. Why not? Get to, get to keep going? Yep. You're good. Cool, man. All right. Home stager. If you're flipping properties, man, you got to get the home stager. Very, very important. Why? Makes the home look bigger. Look at the picture here. It's the same house. Huge difference between the left and the right. Home staging. Yeah, it just makes the home feel bigger. But what it does is it helps, de helps define a space and lets the buyer dream of where the you know, where the couch is going to go, where the TV is going to go. Oh, I can see my kids running around here. I can see us making smoothies at the bar there. Your boy loves smoothies. So you want to paint the picture and paint the lifestyle. That's what really sells deals, man. It's just emotions. That's what we want to play into. And the vacant house absolutely does not do that. Your voice echoes when you're in there. But also what I really like is that it hides mistakes. Now, we don't make too, too many mistakes on our flips because we do good stuff. But I'm telling you, there's always some mistakes on the flips. And honestly, we don't want to hide, obviously, like, you know, major <laughs> mistakes, holes in the floor, leaking foundation. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about little nicks in the baseboard, little nicks in the walls during the renovations, stuff like that. And the staging really, really kind of hides that. There's been many times where uh, I've sold the property without staging and it's brand new. It looks pimped out, right? It looks amazing. But they walk through it and... They say, oh, this laminate is kind of lifting a little here. It's floating there. I don't, just like the stupidest things that they can pick on, right? If there's furniture on the floor and just carpets laid out, whatever, it looks really good. They're not even looking at that stuff. Like I said, they're picturing the smoothies in the morning. They're picturing their kids playing in the backyard, hanging out here on the couch, watching TV. Again, we're playing into the emotions. Staging costs for me normally about 2000 bucks every time for the house, HST included. The best 2000 bucks, honestly, ever. You can see the picture here, how much the difference makes you spend 2000 on staging you're going to add 10,000 to the sale price i can almost promise you that every time so insurance as well super important for flips you have to be insured and you have to have construction insurance it's not your regular uh, rental property insurance and things you might not know now is that times are good but they're getting pickier when it comes to insurance that's because there's so much business right now so many houses being sold the insurance companies are actually kind of in the driver's seat and they're getting really, really, really picky on who gets uh, insurance and, and who isn't. So for example, for me anyway, there's only a few companies that I know of in, in my area that are doing builder's commercial policy for flips, like I said, for vacant properties. And that's the key right there is vacant properties. You can get insurance easy all day long on rental properties. As soon as you tell most people, the cooperators, mutual fund uh, or family farm, I forget what they're called, but you know, like the big names, they're... As soon as you say vacant, they don't like it. They're going to say, nope, it, like we're not in it, period. So you have to get a commercial policy and it's getting harder and harder and harder. 
when you get a commercial policy, again, with a good company, it keeps costs down. For me, on my flips, I pay about 140 bucks a month on the single family flips. Just use that as a reference. Like I said, if you're going to a name brand insurance company, and I'm sorry if somebody here works at those companies I kind of talked about, uh, but I got quotes from those people and it was like 200, 250. One guy was like $500 a month for vacant commercial policy, okay? So again, with flips, we wanna keep our costs down so we can make more profit, but you gotta be insured, you gotta get that. Contractors, probably the most important uh, team member when it comes to flips and also the number one person who will literally ruin your business and your profit, okay? If there's one team member on your team who's gonna screw you, it's gonna be your contractor. It's not gonna be your realtor, not the mortgage broker, not the lawyer, not the accountant. It's gonna be the contractor almost every single time. I've had my fair share with crappy, drunk contractors. I've been through the ringer. And even me being a contractor, that's how I started. Like I said, I did my apprenticeship for carpentry right after high school. I had my own business renovating properties here in Kitchener and Waterloo strictly for real estate investors. Again, I've been working strictly with real estate investors since the age of like 19, 20. And even with all my experience, I still got fooled by a couple bad contractors. So it can happen to anybody, but the more you do this, the more tricks you learn. And now I know what to look for, right? But again, they're the number one person. So you gotta be really, really picky on who you work with. Pay a little extra to get a good quality contractor. For example, whenever I got screwed over by a contractor is when I was trying to find 20 to $25 an hour guys. That's when I got screwed. Now I pay my guys 40 to $45 an hour. That's the range that I kind of play in. And when I attract these types of contractors, I literally have zero issues. Right now we have a great team um, that I keep busy all year long. They pretty much work for me and all my properties. So that's how we're spitting these out super, super quick and reliable. So you want to get quality, reliable contractors. And the other key, like I said, is to keep them busy all year. I know if you're doing one or two deals a year, one deal a year, that's probably not possible. But again, we want to work towards being a real estate investing CEO, right? And the trick to get good contractors and good reliable ones that aren't going to screw you is to keep them busy all year. So for me, we flip about somewhere between 12 and 15 properties a year. We're trying to make that up to 20 coming up soon. And we're going all out with the marketing on that. We'll maybe talk about that later. So we're doing about 12 to 15 flips a year. And I also do like, I don't know, five or 10 buy and hold burrs mostly. So big rentals on top of that all year long. So my guys are busy all year long. That's how I keep them. That's how I pay them. They're happy and they do good work. They trust me. We have a good friendship. And yeah, it's more of a friendship than it is like a business relationship, which is fantastic. So that's what I say about contractors. Do you very, employ- very important. Oh, sorry. Do you employ yeah. your contractors or are you just paying them by the job? Yeah. So that's something that we might be coming up right now. They're just subcontractors, but they pretty much work for me all year long, but they're billing me. They have their own business, their own insurance, all that kind of stuff. Uh, which I like because I don't want to take on WSIB, payroll. That's just a whole other thing I don't want to get into. I'm trying to simplify my life as a real estate investor. Like I said, I'm kind of moving to the next stages in my life where I want to relax a little more and actually live a life. It's been like 10 years of just grinding, grinding, which is very necessary. But now I'm trying to build systems, build a team. So anything easier that I can do, that's what I'm trying to do. So for me, it's easier to keep the contractors of their own business but eventually, if I keep running through contractors uh, and it be, starts be, to become a problem, the easiest fix is yes, just make my own construction company, hire my own employees instead of paying them 20 or sorry, 40, 45 bucks an hour. You bet I'll be paying them 20, $25 an hour, but on payroll. And when I say you're going here tomorrow, they're going there tomorrow. Okay. There's no, you know, they, they can't do their own thing. They're my employees. So there's pros and cons to each. I'm just right now sticking with, I'll just keep a subcontractor who I employ all year type of thing. We'll see, how, we'll see how that goes. It's been working out really well for the past three years, so we'll just keep rolling with it. And, and we have one more quick question yeah, yeah. Uh, that was privately sent to me. Um, the question is, is that, do you have any specific interview questions that you ask your contractors to kind of vet them mm. out? Because I know you do a lot of volume, right? Um, yeah. At a point, I think in your Facebook, you were posting to hire some contractors as well. Yeah, totally. So we're always looking for contractors. I guess uh, the biggest thing for me is seeing their previous work. And if I can go on in person, that'd be great. So they don't Photoshop it or, you know, hide stuff in the pictures. I like to go visit a job site, especially if it's a carpenter, if it's a plumber or electrician, they're a more specialized individual. We can trust them a little more, right? They, they have a ticket, they have skills, uh, but a carpenter, the, I should say that at the beginning, the contractor specifically, who's going to probably screw you the most is a carpenter because they don't have a ticket. They don't have uh, they do have schooling because I went through it, but it's not like mandatory like it is for an HVAC electrician plumber. 
So you get anybody. Anybody can be a carpenter, right? Technically. So those are the ones that you got to watch out for. But yeah, I, I want to see their work specifically, a previous job. But the biggest thing is your gut feeling. Okay. Every time I got screwed by a carpenter, I knew right away. The second I met them, I was like, I don't know about this guy, but I'm so desperate. I got to get this flooring done or whatever. Just do it. That's when I got screwed every single time. So just use your gut feeling, use your intuition. You'll know right away if it's not a good fit. If they roll up in a Honda Civic and they got their tools hanging out of the trunk, like, you know, it's not a good sign. They need a truck, you know, to be respectful and all that kind of stuff. So that's what you're looking for. Just your gut feeling. Okay. So how do we find good contractors? Well, great, <laughs> great timing for that. <laughs> Biggest thing we ask is have they flipped or invested before? It's not mandatory that they invest before, but have they flipped a house or done a major renovation for an investor before? If they have, they get the business. And again, these are great interview questions you can ask uh, when you're meeting a contractor. Referrals from other investors or property managers is key because if your fellow investor in your area has used them and can vouch for them, you know that's amazing because they're likely not going to screw you then because someone else you know has dealt with them. And again, do they seem professional? Can they speak clearly? I don't want to pick on people, but you know, you know, the typical contractor, they're like half drunk. They got missing teeth. The hair is all crazy. You know, that's like the worst case, you know, stereotypical contractor. So like I said, you'll know right away, probably trust your gut always. And the biggest rule for me, as soon as I meet a contractor and they're going to work for me, I drop right away. You cannot job hop, not allowed. If you're a carpenter and you're on my crew, because the carpenter does mostly everything, the flooring, painting, trim, doors, drywall, California ceilings, uh, everything, man. They're doing almost everything cosmetically interior. They're doing the majority of the job, okay? So I always tell my guys, if you want to work for me, you want to work for Fruitful, you cannot job hop. When we start a job, you're on it Monday to Friday, 40 hours a week, eight hours a day, every single day. The biggest thing you want to avoid is your flips dragging out, okay? You guys are borrowing hard money. You're partnering with people. Time is literally money and a flip. The longer you hold, the more money you're going to lose. And th like I said, the biggest thing for contractors is they're going to do two days at your job. And then they're going to say, oh, I just got to go to my other job and do two days over there. Then I'll be back. Then they come back for one day. Then they're at another job for three days. I don't understand. Honestly, like when I was a carpenter doing my business, I never did that. Why? It pisses off every single client and it just never works out. Like when I was doing renovations, I, that's all I did. It was your job, Ben, let's say. That's all I did. I'm on your job, man, until the very, very end. And then I'll get the next job and, and I'll line it up after that. These guys who do three jobs, four jobs at once, I don't understand. Anyway, <laughs> I can talk about that all day long. Very, very, very important. Cannot job hop. And if you tell them that and they say, oh, I can't promise that. I can't. Okay, red flag, get out. There's 30 more contractors behind you. And this is how you literally have to talk and act with a contractor. Like you are the real estate investor. You are in charge. You are the boss. You have to let them know that you're the boss man, boss man or boss woman. That's what we got to do. <laughs> so how do I pay and set up my contractors? So my main contractors, th this is very important too. For the carpenters, I want labor quotes only. Okay. So I'm not getting everything mashed into one. I'll tell you why. So when I bring them through a job, we close on the house. I bring them through whatever, walk through the house. You're going to do this. You're going to rip out that through the floors, baseboards, etc. Now I want the quote and I want it labor only. Again, how you're going to get screwed on these flips is these sneaky contractors. <laughs> the way they make their money is they give you a mashed in quote. Okay. Materials and labor, because if the flooring is only two bucks a foot, they're going to charge you two fifty a foot. Why? I don't know. They're going to pocket the 50 cents. That's how they make more money. And you won't even really know that if they just give you a quote and say, Oh, I'll do this entire flip for 50,000 bucks. And you're like, okay, that sounds about right. Sure. You, you might've overpaid five or $6,000, et cetera. So what I do is I want labor only and I order and pay for most of the materials. So my contractors will pick up building materials. So two by fours, drywall, I'm not going to mess around and order that. They need to keep that to get the job going. But the fan, and I still want receipts for that, but the fancy stuff, the flooring, the taps, the hood range, the fridge, uh, the countertops, whatever, everything, all the pretty stuff, all the cosmetic stuff that actually costs money. I'm buying all that. I'll have it shipped to the house or my project manager will pick it up and drop it off. Once you get to that level, you'll also have a project manager, which is a lifesaver. It's amazing. But for most of the stuff, we actually just get it ordered right to the house, which we'll go through some of the materials that I get. I almost all my stuff is online, Amazon, Wayfair, Home Depot. Uh, yeah, surprisingly, I get a lot of stuff from Amazon, which is amazing. 
So everything just goes right to the house and I buy all that. It literally takes me like two hours to order everything for the whole house. So it's, it's super easy. And again, that's how we know exactly what we're uh, paying because for the labor only quote, if they say, okay, Matt, I'm going to do this whole flip for $20,000. The, the way you know if they're screwing you is to reverse engineer their quote. And the more renovations you do, the more you'll know how long things should take. For example, okay, the flooring for the main floor is going to take uh, six hours on average. The, the painting will take four days with two guys, whatever. So you can count up all the hours and reverse engineer their quote. So if they say $20,000, okay, cool. The whole job should take 30 days with two guys, 40 hours times two times four weeks or times one week times four, et cetera. You get where I'm going. That'll give you the total amount of hours times that by $40 an hour, which is what you want to charge. It comes out to 16,500 and you go, wait a second. Why are you charging me $20,000? This should be 16,500. Oh yeah, you're right, Matt. It make, that makes sense. I get it. You see what I'm saying? So that's how we know exactly if, you know, somebody's top in the court a little bit. Now, like I said, I want to be fair and pay my people right. That's why we're paying them 40, 45 bucks an hour, which for a carpenter, that's a, that's a damn good wage, right? Like we're paying way above market wage, but I expect honesty, right? I expect reliability. So that's, that's kind of how you can reverse engineer a quote and you'll know right away if you're overpaying or not. So that's how we keep things tight. Again, contractors pay for their building materials. I add the fancy stuff. I buy all that keeps them honest and we pay them 40, 45 bucks an hour. So that's a very, very important section on working with contractors and how to make sure you don't get screwed. So we have a question, Matt. Yeah. Um, before we get into the question, I agree with you 100%. I do a lot of the same things that you're pointing out there. So with the flooring, the light fixtures, the glamorous stuff, I'll pick and choose it. Building yeah. material, they actually have my Home Depot commercial card. So I can see yeah. every single transaction that they make, right? And Perfect. if I see something, I'm like, what the hell's happening here? Yeah. Why did you buy that, right? Exactly. Um, so yeah, there are tons of ways to go about it. So one of the questions we have is from Ellen. During your early stage of investing, how many contractors did you interview for a job? Yeah. Uh, like honestly, like one or two. Uh, just because I, I, I work off of, uh, well, the... I don't want to give it away too much, <laughs> but we're coming up to it. But the, the reason why I attract good contractors, just like how I attract uh, money partners and et cetera, is my marketing, right? All, all the stuff I'm doing. So people know if they want to work with me or not. And one thing I always say is if you want to work with me, you know, here's my videos of my properties. Here's what I expect from you. I, I'm kind of weeding them out right there. Again, the Joe Blow contractors going to look at my video and be like, oh man, I, I can't do that. I'm, you know, my stuff sucks. He's going to see me right away. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of weeding people out that way, but I'm also using uh, referrals. And like I said, I, I feel like I have a very good intuition about people. I trust my gut a lot now, a lot more than I did before. And I can really tell when somebody's off. So it really takes only one or two people, uh, one or two or three people to interview. And then, like I said, when I find that good contractor, I keep them, right? I keep them busy. I'm all about relationships and being very loyal and trustworthy. So when I have one good electrician, one good plumber, good carpenter, they get all my work. I'm not, I'm not looking for the best deal all the time. I'm sure I could find a cheaper electrician tomorrow. I'm sure I could find a cheaper plumber. It doesn't matter. My guys are trustworthy. We like each other. It's fair. So when I find a good one, which takes a, you know, a little bit, I keep them. And I don't look anywhere else unless problems come up, which will happen eventually, right? So that's just the way it is. That's and the way I found thing, it. Guys, yeah. Um, this book is a lifesaver, the book on estimating rehab costs. So that's another thing nice. you guys can check out supplementary material. If you guys are struggling, um, trying to do back of the envelope map for uh, labor costs. Nice. Perfect. Great resource. All right. Let's get into the renovation system or er, system. What you want to do is specialize and find what your buyer wants. Again, we want to get really emotional. What do our buyers want. So for me, I specialize mostly in starter homes, single family, first time home buyer homes. So excuse me, <laughs> specifically, that was a hard one to get out of there. Um, I'm attracting millennial buyers mostly. So trendy buyers, ages 25 to 30. That's my niche. Those are the buyers I'm focusing on. So what do they want? You can see the picture here on one of our recent flips. This is totally screaming millennial at me. So that's the way we do all of our flips. I know exactly what they want. So I make a list of what works material wise. And we use the same thing over and over and over again. If you guys follow me on YouTube, you see all my before and after flips on my after flips. You guys are probably bored, aren't you? 
Every house looks the exact same. I know it's boring, man, but it works. It makes me money. We don't have to be an HGTV show where every single house has got to look different. You know, this is the farmhouse. This is the modern urban loft. Not, like we're not doing that. Every house in real life, every house is, looks the exact same. Uh, and that just keeps things easy. Again, you're training your contractors because they know right away. As soon as we start a house, they're like, oh, Matt, let me guess. The accent wall's going over there. The kitchen's going to look like this. You bet. It's the same thing over and over again. Autopilot. Everybody knows exactly what's going on. I don't even have to tell my contractors anymore, really, what to do. They just walk in. They're like, yeah, Matt, we got it. Easy. It looks just like the last house, right? That's all you want. So what business do you guys think you're in? Comment in the comment. Austin, hit me up with what they're saying. What business do you guys think you're in? Let that sink in for a little bit. While people think of that question, guys, we're not going to pass the slide until you guys drop an yeah, answer. We ain't going past it. We ain't going well, past it. You shall well, not pass. <laughs> I know the answer because yeah, I'm exactly. in the course, but I'm yeah. going to keep it on a down low. What business do you guys think you're yeah. in? I Could think be. you have a lot of followers who watch your video. Everyone's yeah. kind of getting it right. Don't Marcy. say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. No. <laughs> a lot of people will mostly say business, flipping, people, business, business cash people, flow, financial exactly. freedom, marketing. Those are very, the responses we're getting. Very popular ones, right? Real estate. I get it. I get it. This is the business you guys are actually in. Ready? Ready? Here we go. We're ready. Marketing. Okay. <laughs> yes, you do real estate investing. You do flipping. You do buy and hold. I get it. The business you're actually in is marketing, especially when flipping houses. Like I said, we're targeting a very, very specific buyer. I want the young millennial who's 25 years old, the wife works at, I don't know, like a white collar job for an admin. The, the husband is maybe a carpenter or electrician. Those are kind of the target uh, buyers I'm going after. Sometimes it's not always like that, but that's kind of the trend and the style we're going for. So I'm getting real deep. And that's how we pick our materials. That's how we pick what backsplash we're doing, et cetera. It's all about that. So, and again, about the marketing is that you want to market your listings better than your realtor is probably going to do. Okay. Nice marketing and nice pictures, nice videos is very, very important on your listings. When you're done, you're flipping. It looks amazing. You want high quality pictures, but more importantly, a high quality video. Okay. I'm a realtor. Surprisingly, man, I'm like one of the only realtors in town that does videos of the properties and videos in a very trendy way. I'm sure you've seen, you know, the, the, that lame realtor video with the slideshow, just a picture and they put on like, I don't know, cheesy jazz music. It's just a picture slideshow. That's not what I'm talking about, man. I'm talking about like a HGTV, you know, marketing video. That's what you want to do. And that just elevates your properties and just creates a ton of competition, especially in this market where the market's already hot for us. It's doing half the work for us. You bust out a nice trendy video on that flip. You're just going to flood your house with listings. And again, we want to play to the emotions of the potential buyer. Even in the video, we're focusing on, on what, like, what do they want? What does the kitchen look like? If you can even hire actors, which like, I just want to do so bad on so many of my flips is hire actors to be in the video. Like that's what I'm talking about, man. Like commercial music video kind of stuff. That's what it takes. If you want to be a real flipper and you want to make the big bucks, you got to do stuff like that. Why? Nobody else is doing it. Nobody, not even the top realtors in the towns. They're just doing pictures and crappy pictures. So we want to market our properties really, really well. This is one thing I do as well. This is a picture on almost, well, not every, sorry, not almost on every listing that I do. I offer a Google home on the kitchen counter and I put that little sign right there. Why do we do that? Who's my customer? The young millennial. They want technology. When they come through my house, it's all staged, looks sweet. They see the Google home on the counter. It says, I come with the house. Boom. Deal's done. Right? Like that, that's the silly little stuff that we got to do again. I'm playing to the emotions. I know who my buyer is going to be and I'm giving them what they want, a little treat. Going to the actual renovation style now, okay? Gray is the new beige, okay? 2004 is over. We don't want the beige anymore. <laughs> gray is the new beige, a nice light color gray. It's neutral. It keeps things uh, easy for everybody. Everybody likes a neutral house. And when we do the staging, we do the pops of color in the staging. So the house comes alive. It looks trendy. But you take that staging out, the house kind of looks a little boring because it's so plain and neutral, but it appeals to every buyer. The buyers can, can visualize what they're going to do, what colorful painting they're going to put on the wall, et cetera, et cetera. We also keep things light and airy. So super light colors. Um, if you guys watch my videos, we're actually changing a lot of the uh, color scheme on our next flip right now we're doing. So in a couple of weeks, that flip is going to be done. 
I'm so excited for this new color scheme we're going for. I'm, I'm not going to give it away, but like, I'm just really excited because you'll see. Like, it, it, we're really appealing to the millennial buyer and just so light and airy. I can't wait. And like I said, use color in your staging. Keep the, the fundamentals light and kind of boring, neutral, and we have fun with the staging. That's some HGTV's tips right there. <laughs> and again, very important, we want to sell the house with kitchen appliances. A lot of mistakes I see from flippers is they're not selling with the appliances. I don't know where they got that from but they leave the, the fridge out, the stove out. I'm telling you that makes a huge, huge difference. Why? The, the appliances are the jewels of the kitchen. Like when they're not there, it just looks stupid. Like it doesn't, it, something looks off, but also first time home buyers specifically probably can't afford to go out and spend 8K, 9K on appliances after they close. They only have so much money in their pocket, probably barely enough just to scrape up the 5% down to buy the house. So if you put the burden on them to cough up that money and then go uh, spend cash on the appliances, you're going to turn off a lot, a lot of people. And I've seen it happen time and time again with flippers that I help in the kitchen while you who flip and they don't do appliances, biggest mistake ever. So super, super important. And it also draws the eye away from mistakes. We always want to take the eye away from mistakes or awkward layouts or whatever about our houses and nice stainless steel appliances or nice appliances in general just make things feel complete. People won't spend so much time looking for mistakes. So we wanna order most things online. That's how us real estate investors keep things, uh, keep things moving in our business. We're not spending time going to Home Depot and shopping for hours and hours. I used to do that back in 2014 when <laughs> online shopping wasn't really good. I spent way too much time walking around Lowe's and Home Depot. I'm wasting time. Again, what's your responsibility as an investor? Close deals, raise money. You shouldn't be going to Home Depot, spending six hours a day buying faucets and stuff like that. So we want to order most things online. Super easy. Get them shipped to the house. Nice and easy. So I get my vanities from Ikea, for example. Light fixtures I get from Wayfair. Super trendy, cool, and cheap lights. Sink and taps I get from Costco. Range hoods and other bathroom taps I get from Amazon. Like I said, I can order everything for the whole house pretty much in like two hours and just have it shipped right to my house or that house specifically. So I'm going to give you a free material giveaways. I'm going to give you some of my fruitful secrets, just a little bit, just a little bit. I'll give you the opportunity to get all my stuff in a bit, but I'm going to give you some free stuff. I got to get you going. I got to get you going. All right. So the countertops I use specifically is called ocean foam. This is a quartz countertop with a white shaker cabinet. If you saw back from the other picture where I showed the whole kitchen, dude, like that's a good look. Okay. So ocean quartz, you can see I got the black sink, the black tap. It looks amazing. Like I said, soon I'll give you the opportunity to get all my stuff and literally where to buy it. Second thing, last thing I'm going to give it for free is the paint color, that nice light gray I talked about is called Burnish Clay by Bear. Okay, so if you take that paint color and you go to any paint store and just color match it, whatever you want. In this lighting, it looks a little beige for some reason, but I'm telling you, it's a, it's a light, light mushroom gray. That's what we're going after. So that's the second and the last one I'm going to give it for free. <laughs> all right. So what I like to do and what I find is really good is to flip in first time buyer areas or price ranges. So for me in Kitchener Waterloo, that price range is 650 and under the after repair value, the final sale price. Ideally you want to make it 650 yeah, yeah. or less. That's what you want to look for. Sure. I think someone's mic's on. <laughs> All right. We also want to do is reduce the, what this does is reduces the risk because for me in Kitchener, if we're uh, flipping properties in the 700s or the 800s in, in Toronto, that's, that's probably your first time price range. But for me, it starts to get a little harder. That's a second time home buyer price range. There's less of them. There's very little competition in that kind of price range. That's not where we want to be. We want to be where the action's hot. There's buyers left, right, and center. There's desperate buyers who want to buy your house, which is the first time home buyer market right now. So plan that out. When you're targeting your flyers or your marketing or, or your door knocking, you want to be hitting up these first time home buyer areas. You want to buy the crappiest house on the nicest street in the first time buyer price range. That's what I would really recommend. Reason why you can sell to anybody. You can sell to a, a first time home buyer, a second time home buyer who's downsizing or an investor who wants a very, very boring rental property. That's turnkey. They can just buy it, rent it out. So it appeals to everybody. The most amount of buyers want these houses. And again, also draws the eye away from mistakes. I don't know why I got that in there. Maybe that was a typo. <laughs> Outsourcing. You want to have fancy materials delivered to the property. As I said, keeps things easy. Contractors pick up the building materials. Um, 
that keeps you out of Home Depot for six hours. And what you want to do eventually, I'm telling you, even if you're flipping one property at a time, let's say you're flipping four or five houses a year and you know, each project takes two or three months or whatever. Even if you have that low volume, I would say of flips, I would still recommend hiring a project manager, build that into the cost of the flip, negotiate another 2000 bucks of the deal from the seller to pay for that project manager. It's going to make your life so much better as a personal human being. So you can relax and enjoy life and not work, you know, 15 hours a day, but it just keep, it makes you want to grow a real business in scale. So for me, I have a project manager. Like I said, I can't talk about her enough. She's an absolute lifesaver and ha have them visit at least one, uh, one to four days when the project's going on. At the beginning of the project, they're probably going to go maybe every two days and then it can back off from there. Maybe they can go once a week. Like it's not much guys. You're, you're not paying them that much. Okay. I pay mine 25 bucks an hour, hundred percent worth it. hundred percent worth it. So if you really want to be a real flipper and scale this up, got to hire one, take the leap. I wish I would have done it years ago. I just did it about a year ago and yeah, can't talk about it enough. You want to outsource as much as possible while you still make money. Of course, I know spending money is very hard because you want to keep as much as you can, especially when you're starting out, but super, super important. So let's get into some common flipping mistakes from what I see all the time. Paying too much for a property. So someone who's desperate to flip, they're not getting too many leads in. They only have a thousand dollars a month to spend on marketing. You're trying to milk every dollar you can out of it. I get it. I know spending money on marketing sucks when nothing comes back. So when something does, you you know, you try and force it, try and force a deal. You can't force a deal. Like it's got it for a flip. It's got to be a really, really, really great deal. Okay. And the other mistake I see is you're, you're eager to get some and you're just adding more risk and more stress. Cause again, you're trying to buy something. You're trying to keep your team busy. I, this is a lot of stress guys. This is the real stress about being a real estate investor. So you can't, uh, can't be doing that. Can't be paying too much for properties. Uh, being too picky about a property is a second kind of mistake that I see. So the flip side of that is the other side was too desperate to buy to, to make any deal work. The second mistake is always looking for a grand slam deal. It has to be a smoking deal. That's another mistake because you're not going to buy anything, right? So some investors are like, I got to make a hundred thousand dollars in two minutes or else I'm not doing the deal at all. Right. That's a lavish example, but like, that's what you want to avoid as well. You can't be too picky. So for example, for me, you know, if a deal makes me 20,000, 25,000, when I'm done it and I don't have to spend too much time doing it because my project manager is taking most of the, of the, you know, of the work out of it. Cause she's doing everything for the, uh, scheduling and stuff. That's great. Like that's enough for me. Right. Who doesn't want to make 20 K doing almost nothing. Right. That that's good enough. You don't have to make a hundred thousand dollars. So you want to be busy and stay active because a rusty flipper is a bad thing to be. You got to be on the pulse, know what's happening in the market and stay active. So stay busy but don't be too desperate and buy every single deal you come across, right? So it's a fine line, but try and play within it. So again, what do I look for in a profit? Like I said, 20,000 for a super easy one. I'm looking for 25, $30,000 for a 30 day flip. If, uh, if the rental is going to be 60 days, which for me is a big flip, that's a long flip for me. It's gotta be around the 50 K mark. So that's those metrics are what I'm looking for. Final questions on flips before I get into the JV stuff or crushing yeah. through this. So there's a couple of questions. Um, one of them, I try to use all of the same materials, but I'm finding that uh, Home Depot will be out of stock when I need it sometimes. How do you pick materials that will always be available? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one to kind of go through because a lot of times we buy materials and they kind of get discontinued, especially lately. I don't know why. Some of the stuff we get discontinued, that's just part of being a real estate investor. It is going to happen. But uh, just keep looking. Again, if, you're, if your finger's on the pulse, if you have a project manager, like I'm saying, or, or somebody who's taking care of all that stuff for you, they can look for other similar items online, Amazon, Wayfair, Costco. Like I said, there's a number of different things to buy that'll be similar. So you shouldn't ever really run out or like totally derail your project. But uh, yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a real thing that's going to happen. But just stay on the pulse. You'll find something else. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question. What are your thoughts about white walls? Seems like a good way to make the mm -hmm. space bigger and super fresh. Yeah. So white walls are becoming much more popular. Um, I haven't done it yet just because it leaves a lot of dirt on the wall. Like if your contractors touch the wall, it's super hard to keep perfectly clean. So that's why we do a super light gray. 
But you could definitely do it. Like if your ideal buyer, like I said, is the young millennial in Toronto who wants to buy an urban condo, like that white wall kind of fits more with a big open 12 foot ceilings. You might paint the ceiling black. Like that, that look really sick, right? So it kind of depends what your buyer wants. I think my buyer would want like a, like a light gray just so it's not too plain. We're, you know, we're not too trendy, too urban here in Kitchener. So again, it just depends like what does your buyer want? But yeah, the white walls will look sweet. What are your thoughts on accent pieces? So I know you personally yeah. do a lot of accent walls, right? So Yeah, so every single house for us gets one accent wall. Again, the new color is coming out. So now we used to do like a dark blue with the light gray. Now we do a black with a dark gray, or sorry, the light gray. And then we paint the doors black, which is really like, I was like, whoa, black doors. I don't know, man, but it worked out so amazing. So that's another like accent feature throughout the house. So yeah. I, I play with that for sure. So you want to be a little daring. Like you don't want to be too boring. You don't want to do the typical, cause like a home building, like a new build. That's what we want to avoid. We don't want to be like a new build, you know, looking flipper. That's not what we want. We want to stand out, have a little bit of edge, a little bit of HGTV ness, but we don't want to be, uh, yeah, just doing boring stuff. So that's gotcha. Gotcha. And I guess you already answered this, the target profit you're looking. So you're looking from 25 to 30 or 50 K for your 60 day flips. Exactly. Yeah. That's kind of the target I'm trying to hit. What type of expenses are you also seeing in your flips? Um, so I know you talked about labor or material, yeah. but there's also the realtor fees as well and, and stuff yep. like that, right? Yeah. Realtor fees. I guess that'd be a good question to go over now on, I, I didn't have a slide for it, but I'm going to do it right now live is how I price my flips. Like what offers do I give to sellers to make sure that I can pay for all the costs. So here's what I do. So I do the after repair value. I'll get my calculator right here so I don't look like an idiot. <laughs> all right. I'm not that smart, guys. I'm smart, but not that smart. Okay. So if I know the after repair value on my house that I'm going to flip is 600000 this is what I do. When I'm done with it, I know it's 600000 So I times that by 80%. So I'm taking 20% out of the deal immediately. Why do I do that? And by the way, this pitch I'm doing to you right now is exactly what I tell the sellers when I meet them in person. This is exactly how I'm talking to them. It's the exact same thing. So Mr. Seller, when I'm done with your house, it's going to be worth 600. And I'm totally on. I tell them everything. It's going to be worth 600. Now I take 20% out because 7% or, or so goes to financing. Another 3% or so goes to holding costs, property taxes, utilities, and then 5% goes to realtor fees. So I'm going to be left with a 5% profit. I'm only making 5%, right? Which is what a seller or, or what a realtor is going to make. And like, again, this is how I'm talking to the seller. So I'm only going to make like 25, 30,000. It's not like I'm making a hundred thousand. Like you see on the HGTV shows, that's not real life. Okay. So that's why I take 20% out of the deal on the final price, Mr. Seller, but I still haven't renovated the house yet. Right. I still got to pay for the renovations. So we renovate these single family homes for about 75,000 or, or like whatever the renovation is going to be like 40,000, 50,000. But for mine, they're usually 75,000. So when I'm talking to the seller, I say, I still have to renovate. It's going to cost me about 75,000 to make it look like what I need. So I take the 75,000 off of that. Right. And that's the price I pay. So I just messed it up. <laughs> We're live guys. All right. Minus 75 K. So the final price is 405 grand. I show them the calculator. That's what I can offer you, Mr. Seller. Like that's how it works. And when I find, when I do that pitch, they can't get mad at me. They can say, no, the offer is way too low. My buddy Joe next door sold it for 550. I understand. I got to pay four or five. That's, that's the system I play. Like that's the formula I have to do to abide by to make sure I make money. So again, they can say no, but they're not going to be pissed off. Cause what I used to do is go through the house, walk with the seller and they say, okay, Matt, what's the price you can pay? $405,000, Mr. Seller. They'd be like, get out of here. Get out. What? My neighbor just sold for, you know, it's a number. It came out of thin air. That's what it seems like to them. I just pulled a number from my ass. It doesn't make any sense. So when I break down the formula, at least they get it. It makes sense. They understand what I'm doing, why I'm doing. And again, they can disagree, but they can't throw me out of the house in huge anger. And, and again, yeah, sorry. I was saying one more quick tip. What I actually do is I bring my phone with me. And the reason why you want to videotape your after flips is to use it for the next one. So when I go through to meet a seller, before I pitch this whole number pitch I just did for you, I'll walk through the house with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, nice house. And what I do is, okay, before I give you my offer, I just want to show you what we're going to do to your house, Mr. Seller. I want to show you what we do to our flips and what our houses look like. So I'll take my phone out and I'll show them my last flip. I'll make them watch the listing video that I told you guys about. I make them watch that. It's like one minute long, minute 30 long, but they'll see like, holy shit, like that house looks really nice. My house doesn't look that nice. 
Because what a lot of sellers will say is, I just did the floors five years ago. And it's like, yeah, but you use like a, they're like the worst floor you could ever do. Yeah, but it's brand new. I know, but I got to rip it up anyway, man, because it's not my, my style. I showed you the video. See the coarse countertops, etc. So when they say my house is turnkey, it only needs 5K. Yeah, right. They see my video and they go, shit, my house needs like 80K. So when I tell them I'm going to spend 75K, they're like, yeah, like that makes sense. I saw your video. For sure, you'll spend 75K. So again, that's what we do. Okay, what question do you have, Austin? No, I love it. I love it. Um, so, oh yeah. So the question I was going to ask is, is that when you run through those numbers with them, so you're saying like 600,000 is the after repair value and you kind of work backwards. Are yeah. you being kind of conservative on that end? So yes. you know that you might be able to get 630, you know, exactly. the renovations are going to hit like 50 K, but you're saying it's going to be this, this. this exactly. Back. So yeah. I'll fudge the numbers a little bit. Again, we want to be very honest. Like I tell my, the sellers everything. I'm going to tell them exactly how much I'm going to make, give or take. I'm going to fudge the numbers a little bit. If I know the house is going to be actually worth 625, I hope I'm going to do the 600 calculation, right? Just so when I pitch in the 405 and they're like, my neighbor's over 550, there's no way I'm going that low. And they go, but I really got to sell. I'm desperate because there's something going on. Will you do 430? I'll be like, all right, you twisted my arm. I'll do 430. <laughs> I ended up exactly where I wanted to be ish, yeah. right? So we want to have some play. It's very rare. I almost actually almost never. Where I give the seller my one price and they're like, I'll take it. Never happens. They always want to come up a little bit. So if I give myself a little room, I can come up a little bit, right? That's but genius. Yeah. And Terry just said, shit, my house needs 80 grand worth of renos. Quote him. <laughs> Don't think you feel too good about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's no more questions on that end. Again, cool, guys, make sure to drop your questions. We'll be asking Matt throughout the presentation. Yeah. All right. Into the joint venture attraction. This is where it is. So I taught, I taught you guys how you should scale your business, how to do flipping, but you got no money right now. How do you get the money to do these flips, to do the birds, to do the buying holes? I'm going to show you the 2020 fruitful, fruitful way. And by the way, this. I'm one of Matt's students for this too. Yeah. Like I take, I was, I think one of the first people to take it. Totally. Of course, you know that I applied it and yeah. I've, I've actually raised millions of dollars in capital as well. Totally. So I've, I've been watching Austin guys. I've been watching them and his social media game and stuff is just on point. So we're going to talk about how we do this and Austin's done everything. So good guy to follow. All right. Where are my introverts? Drop it in the chat. You're probably going to get like one because you're, int <laughs> you're introverts, right? So am I. I'm an introvert. Yeah, have so a I, of, I have a couple of introverts. Sweet, yeah. sweet, sweet. If I could hear you guys, where are my extroverts? Where are you guys? Extrovert. You're lucky you're, lucky you're all muted. Extrovert, it, turn your mic off. Yeah. And say Woo! Yeah, right? Extroverts. You guys are life of the party. You're loud. We hear you. We hear I you. I should okay? see Daniel turn. Daniel, you should yeah. be turning that off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, keep, you keep that mic off, man. All right. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> all right. So again, what business do you guys think you're in? I kind of ruined it from before. You guys already know. Marketing, okay? So it's all about marketing, especially now when we're getting into the JV attraction, okay? So how do you think you find money partners? Drop that in the comments. Austin, Daniel, hit me up. What are people saying? How do you guys think you're finding money partners nowadays? Do, 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 do. Networking. Social Networking, media. yeah, yeah. I got some followers on here, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> it looks so, like it. Yeah. So typically, the first answer, networking, this is normally what people did in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, early 2000s. This is how you used to find money. You pitch stuff on a whiteboard. You do a meeting. You go meet somebody for coffee. We don't have time for that. We're too busy, what? Raising money and buying deals. I don't have time to meet a potential person to talk for two hours about the deal I got for them just to go, no, I don't have time for that. So that's not what we do anymore. What we wanna focus on nowadays in 2020 is branding, okay? So what that means is I'm letting people know what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, I'm showing it on all my branding, which I'm gonna show you how, I don't wanna give it away too much, but essentially what I wanna do is attract the people with money to me, okay? For me, I've never once gone out and pitched or met somebody for coffee and tried to convert them or, you know what I mean? They've all come to me saying, Matt, I need to invest with you. I see what you're doing. Please let me invest with you. It's crazy. Big difference. So a lot of people ask me, Matt, how do I find partners? How do you think I find all my partners? Put that in the chat box. How do you think I find all of my partners? Now that I told you a bit about what you got to do, Austin, what are people saying? IG, you don't. IG. They find you. They find you. They got it. They got Instagram. it. So 
Yeah, Instagram for sure, but mainly YouTube. Okay. In fact, 100% YouTube. I use Instagram, but really what, what gets people, I'm doing a fishing hook thing here. If you, if you can't see me, <laughs> I'm reeling them in. Okay. YouTube is where I found all of my partners. Can you believe that? A hundred percent of my partners have come from YouTube. They watch me on YouTube and they contact me and they pretty much beg me, Matt, please let me invest with you. I have to. Okay. It's crazy stuff. Again, I'm not going out trying to convince people. That's what we want to avoid is convincing. Okay. It comes off. Well, it's just a lot of work. It's stressful. It comes off as desperate sometimes because you're trying to pitch your deal. Oh, look, I get, you know, 13% cash on cash. Like, please invest with me. Like we don't want that. People contact me and say, Matt, I got to invest with you. And again, in the comments, how many people do you think have ever asked me, Matt, what's the cash flow going to be on this property? What's the cash on cash going to be? What's the ROI on this deal if we do it? How many people do you think have ever asked me that? You guys I'll ask know. you. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Andrew Austin will. Austin's, Austin's a master of numbers, so he definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> but for my, my partners, zero. Okay? Zero people have ever said, Matt, how much are we going to make? Like They just they watch me. They, they trust me. They know the system. They know we're going to make money. They don't, they don't ask. That's what you want to do. It's easy. So YouTube has made me more than $3 million easy in the past four years. Can you believe that? Not from, you know, YouTube money on videos. That's, that's small stuff. I'm talking about real money. Okay. I use YouTube to buy the real stuff, real estate. And that's how I've made well over $3 million in the past four years. So it's insane and nobody's doing it. Nobody's doing it to the full extent. Okay. So have you ever wanted a deal, but have no money hit it up in the comments? Have you wanted a deal, but you, had, but you had no money to buy it? It was a great deal. Couldn't buy it. Did you want to grow your real estate portfolio, but you can no longer qualify? So maybe you, yeses. maybe you have the money, but you can't qualify because maybe you own too much real estate. You have too much debt. That sucks. Have you ever pitched a deal to an investor? And they said, no, even though it made perfect sense. Cash on cash return was 13% like Austin likes, right? ROI was crazy. Cash flow was 500 bucks a month. Everything made sense, but they still said, no, I'm not going to do it. Why not? It's crazy, right? That's so frustrating. Like I said, when we do it the right way with branding, these things very rarely happen. So what you're going to learn in this presentation now, the last section is how to get partners to literally throw money at you, how to brand yourself as the solution that people have to partner with you and how to target market to your ideal partner. Remember in the flipping section, how we're renovating to a very, very specific person. We're doing the same thing in this side of the business. Now I don't want to market to everybody. I want to market to one very, very specific type of person. Now, if more people come in, that's great, but I'm very targeted in my message. We'll talk about that soon too. So why listen to me? I'm going to go over this again. Bought my first probably 22 years old. Now have 30 properties. I got to update this 35 properties. 10 million in real estate, raised over $20 million in funds. You can see how old the presentation is, <laughs> which is great. Realtor specializing with investors. You already know it. So like I said, the whole industry of business and marketing is changing. We're done with the 1990s stuff. That doesn't work anymore. Okay. So I love going to networking meetings to get pumped up. Like that's the only reason why I go, honestly, to get pumped up, to hang out with Austin, hang out with Dan, hang out with all these great investors. That's what I love to do. Keeps me motivated. We can talk about real estate because nobody else will you know, out there. Right. So I, I got to hang around all you weirdos to get pumped up. That's what we want, but I'm not going to those events to get money partners. It can happen. Why not try? But if everybody's at those events looking to learn about real estate and looking to learn about how to raise money, everybody there's got no money. How are you going to partner with somebody at those events? Cause everybody's looking for money. Nobody's got money. So you're looking in the wrong places. If that's your only strategy, like I said, it can happen. I've had it happen a few times, actually not, you know, by accident kind of, but I'm not going with the intent for my sole strategy to be going to networking meetings to find money partners. It ain't going to happen. So who is your ideal partner? So we want to get very, very specific. Again, you're probably saying I'll take anybody with money as long as they have money and they want to partner with me. We're good, right? That's not what you want to do. We want to market to a very, very specific type of person. Again, we're playing with the emotions game. We want to pull people in. So to get more specific, who are they? We want to get on a creepy level. How old are they? Are they 20 years old? Probably not. They have no money. Are they 25? Again, probably not. They have no money. Are they 30, 32, 34, etc.? Do they have kids? If they do, how many? How old are those kids? What are their names? Okay, that's how creepy we're getting. We want to know everything about 
our ideal partner so that we can hit their biggest pains and their biggest pleasures in our marketing, which I'll show you soon. So why we do that? Human beings work on fear and greed, right? You probably heard that before. So we want to play into their fear, right? If you don't invest with real estate with me, the fruitful investor, you're not going to be able to travel the world and chill in Costa Rica on the beach during the winter time, right? If you guys follow me, you know, that's my message. I'm always talking about the beach. I'm always talking about eating coconuts in Hawaii while my business makes me money. Now, for some of you, you're like, I don't give a shit. I like going to Europe. Hawaii's lame. Perfect. You're not the partner for me. Fantastic. That's exactly the point of it. I want to hit the people who care, who like to go to Hawaii and eat coconuts on the beach and have their real estate business still pay them. Now, when I say stuff that specific, rather than this property, I got cash flows, 13% ROI or whatever, like that means nothing. We all understand logically what 30% ROI or cash on cash return means or whatever. We all get that, but it's not going to move anybody forward. We can find those numbers anywhere. When I say, yo, Joanne, let's say, if you invest with me for five years, I'm going to be able to get you to go on vacation for two weeks minimum every single year, totally paid for by this property. So you can spend more time with your kids and have great memories with your kids, but you're only going to get that if you invest with me. Okay. Very huge difference. Now, Joanne, my, you know, person following me, when I say that message, she's like, that's me. Like I want to chill on the beach for two weeks. You know, the 32 year old person hustling, building their business is like, I don't got time for that. You know, <laughs> it doesn't interest me. Perfect. I'm trying to alienate as many people as possible actually and dial in to one specific person. So my guy is Paul. I gave him a name. I want you to give your ideal joint venture avatar a name as well. I know everything about Paul, everything. Paul wakes up at 8 a.m. He's got to get his kids ready for school. He's rushing, he slept in. He should have got up at 7.30, but he slept in. He's too tired, he's too stressed out. He's got to make his kids breakfast, get him off to school. He's at the office by like 9, 10 in the morning because he's late. Had to bring the kids to school for 9 a.m. He's late. His boss is pissed off, etc. <laughs> then he works all day from 9 to 5. At 5 o'clock, he's got to rush home in rush hour. You know, he's, all he sees is brake lights, tail lights, honking horns. He's so sick of it. He's just had a long day. He rushes home, picks up the kids from daycare after school, brings them home, feeds them real quick like a shitty dinner like hot dogs because they're in a big rush. Then he takes them to ballet practice for 6.30, barely makes it on time. He's at ballet practice for two hours gets home at 8.30, puts the kids to bed. It's now 9 p.m. And he only has about an hour left with his wife every night. He only sees his wife for like an hour a night. Their relationship isn't as good as it used to be because he's too busy hustling and grinding. You see what I'm saying, guys? That's what I preach in my videos. That's what I'm talking about. Why do you guys think I post so many videos of me hanging out with Rachel when me and Rachel are, are in Hawaii? We're, we're together. We're happy. We're laughing. Right? We're having fun. We're connected, me and Rachel. That's, that's the stuff. That's a subliminal messaging kind of that I'm doing in my videos. Sounds creepy? It is. Get used to it. That's the kind of marketing. That's how deep we have to go. If you guys want to just get people coming at you, be like, Matt, what you're doing is great. Or Joe or John, what you're doing is great. I got to get in, man. I want to do that. That's what it's all about. That's why we do those things. So marketing equals emotions. We're always playing on the emotions. So a good... Uh, activity you guys can do is this. It's called the empathy map. If you just Google that in Google, you'll find it anywhere. Print this off, put your person's name right in the middle there and just brainstorm. This is called a mind map essentially. So what is your ideal partner think and feel every day? What do they think and feel on a daily basis? Are they tired? Do they feel stressed out because money's tight yet they're working so hard? Stuff like that. What do they see every day? cubicles, floor tile ceiling, or those ceilings, what, what, drop ceiling. <laughs> they see drop ceilings, it's boring, it's stale at the office. What do they say and do? All the stock market's too risky. I like real estate, but I just don't know anything about it. You know, I'm 10 pounds overweight. I should go to the gym more, but I can't because I'm too busy, stuff like that. What do they hear every day? You, like you get where I'm going, right? Then the most important is the pain and gain. What's the pain of your ideal joint venture partner? that they don't get to spend enough time with their kids, that they, they wish they could leave work at 3 p.m. instead of 5 because they have three, four, or five properties that can pay for the extra two hours that they wish they could leave early and not sit in rush hour. What's the game, right? So we're talking, just mind map, and this will change over and over, like 
all the time. This will you change all the time, update it as you go. It will always change the more you learn about your ideal partner. This is the stuff you guys should focus on, guys. Nobody's doing this. But this is how deep we have to get. Okay, so going back, this is what most investors do. They got the fancy pie charts, the bar graphs. Austin's in heaven right now, man. He's got the bar graphs. But again, I guarantee you his ideal partner loves this stuff, right? Am I right? I'll be honest. What you are saying is very true. As I went more into my real estate journey and raising capital, this stuff mattered less. It matters to an extent. There's like a minimum. You can't promise someone like three, four percent return, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, they take it elsewhere. So there's kind of a threshold of expectation that people want. But after that, it's all about if they like you or not and if For they sure. fit with you. And I've noticed that huge shift because when I was first taking your course and learning these things, I was just like, that doesn't make sense. Like I'm an investor. So I look at things from an ROI perspective, but d most people are not as savvy investors as we are, which is why they're trusting us with their money. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, so like, no, definitely. Like at the beginning, I know it's hard to disconnect from this stuff, but to be able to raise like what you did and like what I'm starting to do as well, we got it. Like I definitely hit on the emotions. That's how I'm pivoting totally. kind of my raising capital strategy. Yeah, for sure. And like I said, like your ideal petroleum venture partner might be into this stuff, but I would say very, very few. I'm talking like 1%. Mike Rosehart on the other example, his guys and girls are definitely into this. So he's milking this stuff, right? It depends kind of what your strategy is, right? But most people, the vast majority, when you bring them the pie charts, the bar graphs, the ROI is this, the cash flow is this, cash on cash returns this, they look like the person in the middle. What? They just don't get it. It doesn't make sense. It's just confusing and a confused mind always says no right that's a very popular saying in psychology a confused mind always says no so get away from that stuff this is the 1990s way of how we attract people we're done with that what we also want to be careful of is that there's so much marketing out there right there's so much noise facebook ads are in people's faces when you drive down the street what do you see billboards bench ads Pepsi signs here, the radio, YouTube, you're probably getting spammed by my YouTube videos. I'm just kidding. So <laughs> commercials on TV, Instagram ads, people are getting bombarded with ads, especially from like the year 2005 and on that we're getting like evolutionary, if that's even a word, <laughs> program to just oh, like block it. Out. People are blocking out marketing so much now they're getting used to it. So now more than ever, your message must be super targeted to one person because everybody has their hands over their ears. They don't want to see marketing. It's everywhere. So when you say, you know, for my guy, Paul, you know, I'm traveling in Hawaii. I'm, I'm relaxing for three weeks a year. That resonates with him. He takes his hands off of his ears. He says, what's that? He's interested in what I'm saying. So you have to pierce through all the marketing more than ever. And targeted marketing does that. And what you also want to do is indirect selling. So, I call this soft selling. So in my YouTube videos, you'll see me, like I'm never coming out on the videos and saying like, you need to partner with me because you don't know anything and I know everything. Like we don't want to be that aggressive. Sometimes I am, but hardly ever. But what we want to do is indirect selling. So you see my videos, the only hint I do about partnering is when I'm standing in front of my properties at the very beginning of the video and I say, hey, what's up fruitful investors? I'm standing in front of my next property here that I just closed with a partner. That's the drop and that's it. I don't really say like, you got to partner with me. Just the fact that I said, I bought this with a partner. People know, oh, I can partner with this guy. That's it. I'm indirectly selling. And then I'm showing my results after that. When we travel, when we do travel, I keep talking about the travel videos because my guy's so, you know, involved with that. And again, that's the whole reason why I do the travel videos. Like, why do you guys, why do you guys think I do that? Like, I enjoy making travel videos. Obviously it's fun. But the real reason why I post it publicly on my YouTube channel is because it pisses Paul off a lot. When he sees me hanging out in Bali, living in the tropics, Paul's mad. He's like, what the hell? How is this young guy doing this? I got to partner with him. That's why we're doing it. So again, in my videos, this is why I post all the before and after videos. So very, very important. Guys, if you're closing on deals, post a before and after video every single time. If you haven't done this, try and go back and do it over again if you can. But going forward, every house you buy gets a before video and an after video. Why? When we do the after video, it shows the potential JV person we're going to partner with, what our style is, what our houses are going to look like. So they already know coming in what, what the partnership is going to be like. And that's why, like I said, nobody asked me about cash flow. Nobody asked me about color scheme. Nobody asked me what the cash on cash return is. They've seen it on my channel a hundred times. Every house looks the same. 
they know exactly what to expect when it's time to partner with me. Again, you guys think I like making videos all the time? I, I kind of do, but the real reason is because it works and it's super, super important. And again, the travel videos. I love the travel videos. This, this right here gets my partners every time. Chilling in Costa Rica, France, Italy, Mexico. That's, get, that's what gets the partners for me. So let's get right into the actual marketing strategies. By the way, guys, you guys having fun? Hit that chat box. Any questions before I keep going on? Any questions, guys? Oh, um, do, 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 do. what kind of, okay, I guess you kind of touched on this before as an older question. What kind of returns are they looking for percentage-wise, um, which you, you've talked about? The yeah. numbers is not the selling point, right? It's hitting the emotions. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you're going to touch on it later, but what's kind of your JV structure? Do you want to talk about that later or is it? Yeah, I'll talk about that now because I don't have a slide on that because okay. it's such a simple thing. I'll just do it right now because <laughs> I, knew, I knew the question would come up. So my structure is, the partner brings all the money to the deal and they get the mortgage in their name. This is for buy and hold, by the way. All the money, buying, closing, renovating, et cetera, and the mortgage in their name. That's it. I, on closing day, I take over. So I do everything. So it's basically like they're buying the house on their own as if they would on their own. The difference is on closing day, I take over now. I run the whole business until the end, which we usually hold our properties for three to five years. So I bring in my renovation crew at the beginning. I manage that process. Um, I manage the property managers when it's done. I stay on top of them because believe it or not, hiring a property manager is not set and forget it. You got to manage them. So I do all of that. I manage the bookkeepers, the accountants every year at the end of the year to give my guys statements, all that stuff. I run the whole business. When we sell the property in three to five years, we split the profits 50-50. Very, very simple. 13% cash on cash. Hook it up. Hook it up. Hook it up. Let's go. About, uh, uh, Jashawn says about to write a check to Matt right now. I'm sold. Uh, Jordan. I got him. Got him, baby. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to swim me 2% of that equity, right? Yeah, exactly. Damn right. <laughs> Jordan says, are your JVs putting the full amount up front or just the down payment? Just the down payment. Normally just, just the 20% down plus the renovation costs. And if we're doing a duplex conversion or a bird, we're going to refinance that, pay them back first, right? The whole strategy is to pay them back as fast as possible. And then we split 50, 50. Gotcha. Yeah. I think we're good to go. Answered all cool. the questions. All right. So in the marketing, what you want to do is position yourself as the expert. People only work with pros, people they can trust people. They know they're not going to lose their money. Right. You gotta remember people are given like probably their life savings, a hundred thousand, 200,000. It's a lot of money. They're not going to give that to anybody. Maybe that other guy was because it was easy, <laughs> but this is serious stuff. So you got to be an expert and be seen as such. So you see the rock here. Like, dude, he knows he's the best. He knows he's an expert in weightlifting and everybody knows it. That's what you want to be. That's the kind of confidence that you want to give off when you're talking about real estate or presenting on stage or doing YouTube videos, etc. That's what's going to get the partners to be attracted to you. So how do you do that? Specialize in one niche. When I started off, if you guys know my story, I only bought single family properties and I was a local expert. I only bought single family properties in Kitchener, Wiley, Cambridge. That's it. I didn't do anything else. People were like, yo, Matt, I got this sick duplex in Guelph, which is like 20 minutes away. No, man, I ain't going there. I only buy single family properties in Kitchener. Matt, I got this sweet deal in London. It's only an hour away from you. Nope. I only buy single family properties in Kitchener. So you see how focused I was. I became the expert. I did those properties over and over and over again. I can do a single family property in my sleep. I know how to renovate it. I know exactly what it's going to rent for. I know what it's going to sell for if I flip it, et cetera. And again, that attracts people. Because when I show that in the videos over and over again, people know I'm not going to lose their money. I've done it 30 times in my sleep, right? And you want to show your success. Again, with the videos, all the marketing, which I'm going to show you right now. So the secret to online marketing, guys, this slide right here, if you want to screenshot and steal anything from this, this is the one you want to screenshot. This is literally the blueprint to build and scale any business. But right now we're talking about real estate business. So you want to write blogs. Again, about what? what you specialize in and where you specialize. If you're specializing in duplex conversions in Hamilton, guess what? You're writing blog after blog after blog about that. Top five ways to duplex conversion in Hamilton. Top 10 ways to attract the best tenant for Hamilton real estate, etc. You want to write blog after blog about that. What that does, it ranks your SEO, your search engine optimization. I'm getting to some real nerd stuff here. 
Austin's happy. We're getting into some nerd stuff. <laughs> so this is the kind of stuff you want to focus on and learn about. It's super, super important. What it essentially means is whenever somebody is looking in Hamilton to invest in real estate, your blog is likely going to pop up because you wrote about it. That's how Google works, right? Next thing you want to do is do a video. Now you're probably like, Matt, I just wrote like 13 blogs. Now you want me to do 13 more videos? I don't have time for that. No, you already wrote the script to your video. You wrote the blog. Start with the blogs, and then when you're gonna make a video about the blog you already wrote, but in video format. Easy. You guys are repurposing content, okay? So the biggest thing for me is that people are always like, Matt, you're everywhere. I see you everywhere. I open my Instagram, you're in my face. I open Facebook, you're there. I'm on YouTube, you're there. How do you have time to do all that marketing? I'm like, yo, man, I made one piece of marketing and just in different ways. Like, it's very, very easy, right? So we wanna do that. And again, Google owns YouTube. So those two platforms love each other, essentially. That's the, that's the dumbed down version of that. So when you make videos on YouTube and you write a blog on it, on your website, and then you post the blog, all the text, in your YouTube video description, wow. Google's like, thank you, that's what they want. It links to each other, it goes up in the search engines. Again, I'm getting some nerd stuff, I love the nerd stuff, it gets me excited. Next thing you wanna do is you wanna strip the audio and make a podcast. So again, you're like, Matt, I can't make a podcast. I don't have time to interview people. No, the video. You just strip the audio, put it on a podcast in an audio format. Now you have a podcast. Pretty cool, right? People are like, you got a podcast? You must be a pro. Damn right I am. Okay, then we're going to do one minute video clips on Instagram. Of what? The YouTube video you already made. That's probably 10 or 12 minutes. You probably got five or seven good Instagram clips from that one video you already made. So you're gonna take the best one minute section of that video, post it on Instagram. Now you got seven or five videos for Instagram. Then you're gonna write a book. I want you to write a book. Why? Authors have authority, right? Matt, I can't write a book. I don't have time for that. I got three kids, I got a full-time job. You already wrote the book. You already wrote 13, 15, 16 blogs. Take those blogs, compile them, edit them a little bit to fit in a book format, stick that in a book. Now you have a, and a book can be easy, guys, like 30, 40, 50 pages. doesn't have to be like a 300-page novel. A 40-page book on duplex conversions in Hamilton, right? Like you already wrote the book with the blogs. Easy. Then we want to get into email marketing, okay? So if people want to get your free book that's advertised on Facebook or whatever, they have to give you what? Their email to get the book sent to them. Now they're on your email list, but you're not going to spam them with bullshit. We don't want to do that. We want to give them more free content on the email platform of what the videos you did, the, the podcast coming out on Monday that you recorded, the blog you wrote. We're giving, 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 giving more content. We're in their face all the time to the point where they have to partner with you. They have to see how that worked. That's that again. I'm so excited because that right there is literally the blueprint to build a million dollar business. I don't care if you're a hairdresser, a plumber, an accountant, this is it right here. And for real estate investors, same thing. Okay, so why, what, how, what if? This is how the human brain works. There's four types of personality types. This is what they are. So all of our marketing, everything, the YouTube video, the blog, the book, it must be in this specific order right away. So the why people, these are the people who need to know why right now in the next 30 seconds or I'm out of here. Maybe we had a few people leave. I don't know. We still got a packed house. But sometimes if people don't get the why answer in like three minutes, they're out of here. So you got to answer the why right away in your presentations, in your blogs, your videos. Why invest in duplex conversions in Hamilton? Because they make more money than single families. Okay, the why person is happy now. The what people will wait a little bit for the what. What are we doing? We're buying duplex conversions in Hamilton. We're doing them this way. Okay, cool. The what person is satisfied. The how people want to know how. Well, we're going to do resilient channel on the ceiling. We're going to do rock cell insulation for this sound barrier. We're going to do 5-H drywall so it's fire separate, et cetera. Now the how people are, are satisfied, right? The last people are the best, the what if people. They're going to wait around for this entire two-hour presentation tonight and be like, what if? What if I don't invest with you, Matt? What if I do? We want to answer that question at the end. So this is the order of all of the market. Again, this is psychology. Like this is but the smart people figured out and I just steal it, right? That's how we do it. <laughs> all right, so blog specifically, what do we write about? Write about your niche, like I said, write about your local area, write about the strategy that you're doing, 
and hint about partnering with you in that blog. Again, we don't want to be like blatantly in their face and say, you got to partner with me because you're dumb and I'm not. We don't want to do that. Just hint, hint, hint about how you accept partners. And how do we do that? We want to get a WordPress site. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google up, better yet, YouTube, everything, right? YouTube, how to get a WordPress website. You can do that through HostGator, GoDaddy. I'm sure you've heard of those people. But the blog specifically have to be at least 1,000 to 1,500 words per blog. It's not that much writing, but the reason why we do that is because Google really rewards uh, blogs that are at least 1,000 words. They're going to rank higher. Okay, so we put links at the bottom as well. This is called backlinking. Very, very important for SEO marketing. Google loves backlinks. What that essentially means is a link to your Facebook page, a link to your LinkedIn, a link to a YouTube video, whatever. A link of any kind, Google likes that because it's going back and forth. I guess they like that. Don't ask me, right? And then what we want to do is post the video version in your blog as well. Why? Remember I said Google owns YouTube. If you put the video and submerge it in your blog on your Google website, right? It's going to rank higher. So we want that. Video specifically. Do a video version of your blog, like I said. Ideally, 10 minutes long or more. YouTube is kind of like Google. They have restrictions or, or things that they want. It, any video that's 10 minutes or more, YouTube loves that and it'll rank higher. Okay? So give without expectation. Like I said, just give, 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 give value. And again, hint about partnering with you. Soft sell is what we want. Podcast, very, very simple. Do a separate blog, interview style, whatever works for you. But like I said, you can strip the audio from the video. Just make a nice, fancy little intro, a cool intro, a cool ending. Put that audio clip in the middle. Boom. Export it. Upload it to podcast. Very, very simple stuff. Just Google it. YouTube videos, how to do this. It's very, very simple. Better yet, hire a marketing company to do this. I guess it's a perfect little plug to me throw in right quick. We actually own a marketing company for real estate investors and real estate professionals that we can help worldwide. So if you guys want to amp up your social media to the highest level, we do one-on-ones. We edit your videos. We write your blogs. We uh, edit your Instagram posts. We upload that for you, schedule it. We do everything. Okay. So if you don't know how to do any of that, DM me on Instagram. We'll set you up in fruitful marketing. You'll blow up. That's what we do. That's what we specialize in. The Instagram strategy. We want to make one minute versions of the YouTube videos we posted. That's what Instagram kind of is known for is one minute quick videos. And then we can also post the full video, full YouTube version on our IGTV. So the Instagram post is only one minute long. The IGTV section is I think 20 minutes long now. So we can post usually our whole video on there as well. But what we want to do is push our followers to our YouTube channel. Remember the whole point is to get everybody to our YouTube channel. Remember YouTube is what gets us the money. So get everybody over there, get them off Instagram, get them off Facebook, go check out my YouTube channel, right? And like I said, write a book. You already did. This is the first book I wrote. I've wrote three books now, right? Pretty cool. I wrote three books. Very, very easy to write a book. But again, when I wrote this book, my first book, I think it was like 2013. Dude, I'm telling you, like the business just exploded. Like there was a dramatic difference in everything in my business as a realtor, as an investor for attracting money. When I wrote this first book, single family, remember? Single family investing made simple. The, my life changed. I'm not even gonna like, pretend to avoid that or sound weird. Like literally my life changed when I wrote that first book. And you want to get an email capturing program, like I said. So popular ones are AWeber, MailChimp. I'm sure you've heard of that one. ClickFunnels, if you're more advanced. We want to give your book away for free in exchange for getting the person's email. And in those emails, we want to tell a compelling story. So again, I'm getting really advanced here. I got a, only a limited time here, but like this is a big section as well. We want to tell stories in our emails. That's what sells. That's what captures people. It's called a soap opera email program or email setup. That's what we want to do is just tell a soap opera, right? We leave cliffhangers. We do all that cool stuff. And again, give more and more free tips in that email program. Don't spam people. Don't send them bull crap. Free, free stuff. Social media, real quick on it. Everyone is on it. Literally, like everyone is on it. All your ideal partners, all the people with money are already on social media. It's amazing. So social media is great because we can give short and quick tips. We can give long content. We can talk about our experiences, both good and bad. We can post other people's content. So I always want you guys to make your own content. I, I've been really hammering that all night and you're probably like, I'm too afraid to make a video. I'm too 
you know, I don't feel like I'm smart enough to write a book, to write a blog. Trust me, you are. I really urge you to do that stuff. But if you can't, and you're just like, Matt, I can't do it. I'm too afraid or whatever. Okay, no problem. Post other people's content, reputable people like, I don't know, the New York Times, the Toronto Sun, just, just articles about real estate, whatever, right? Just to let people know that you're at least in real estate. But like I said, ideally, you want to make your own content. So Facebook specifically, this is meant for life updates. We can post articles. We can post our blogs right on Facebook. We can post our YouTube videos right on Facebook. Facebook's kind of a catch-all social media program, which is fantastic. We can do whatever we want on it, pretty much. Instagram, on the other hand, this is the most narcissistic social media platform of them all. It's all about showing your daily life. It's all about beauty. It's all about you know living the life. That's what Instagram is. It's quick. It's supposed to be quick shots of people's lives. Obviously, we want to be real and authentic on there, but that's kind of the premise of Instagram. So we want to play within those rules. So we want to show your business, your renovations, property hunting, et cetera. And right here, guys, Instagram stories will make you wealthy. The posts are great, but I'm telling you, the Insta stories, the quick little shots of your daily update, that's what gets you the actual money. That's why I, if you follow me, I post so much. A minimum of 10 stories a day, pretty much, is what we're doing. I'm showing you guys when I'm making my smoothie, when I go to the gym, when I go to kickboxing, when I'm going to uh, check out properties. I'm showing you guys snapshots of everything. Again, people want to follow along your journey because they kind of want to live through you and it's, you know, uh, anticipate what it will be like investing with you and partnering with you, right? So that's why we give them all of those shots. YouTube specifically, we want to educate your niche, show your daily life, but in longer form content, longer form. So, so yeah, like the property walkthroughs before and afters, that's more of like your daily life kind of videos. And YouTube is really great because it shows your personality, right? So right now I'm either attracting people who like my personality or they're like, man, this guy talks too fast. I don't like him anymore. Right? So the videos is already filtering people for me, right? You know, when you meet somebody or when you watch somebody, if you're going to like them or not, if you're going to jive with them. So videos are really good for that. So what we want to focus on is benefits over features. So the features are the cash on cash return. We're going to do this. We're going to renovate it this way. Don't talk about that stuff, man. The benefits. Should you invest with me, you're going to travel the world more, spend more time with your kids, right? All that stuff. We want to hit the emotions, focus on the benefits over the features. Everybody else is talking about features. We don't want to do that. And you want to be transparent. You want to be real. People nowadays can smell bullshit a mile away, right? We know the cheesy car salesman guy. Hey, what's up guys? Like, we don't want that, right? We're not doing that anymore. So just be true, be yourself and be transparent, be honest. So to recap this part of the uh, presentation here, market to your ideal joint venture partner. Don't bring deals, bring pain and pleasures. Nobody cares about deals. Honestly, you care about deals because you're a real estate investor. The people out there who have the money don't care about deals. They care about pain and pleasures. Become savvy at online marketing and be real and vulnerable. All right, guys, I'm getting near the end of my presentation here. Thank you so much for being on here. I'm going to give you guys... I'm going to give uh, all of Austin's people here a great smoking deal that I only give my YouTube live followers. I only give this deal. So you're, you're, you're going to get all of my courses. So my renovation course, like I said, so literally every single thing that I buy, the taps, the countertops, the flooring, the baseboards, where I get them, where to buy them, you guys get all of that. You'll pro your properties will look exactly like mine. Um, the unlimited cash course, which is my joint venture course, which is this presentation I just did on steroids, which is one Austin took. So you guys get all of that. You'll learn exactly how to write blogs, how to make a website, how to do marketing, how to edit your videos. And I'm also going to give you guys my JV agreement. So I'm going to go over it right here. So a lot of you guys are probably like, okay, how do I do a JV agreement? Don't worry about it. It's in the course. I already paid my lawyer to do it. My JV agreement was $3,000. Okay. You guys get that for free in that course. Like I said, in the renovation course, your problems look exactly like mine. Your renovation will be on autopilot. Man, I feel like I've been talking for like two hours, man. <laughs> it's great. Um, so you guys get all of that. You get all my free books. I have a couple other courses in there. You guys get everything. Like I said, it's an $888 value if you were to buy everything yourself. I'm going to give it to you, all of those courses, for a low price of $397. It's 
dirty. Like that's the price of a kitchen tap. You're going to get all of my secrets for that price. So I'm going to put that in the chat box. If I can, I'll put the link in there. It's only going to last for this presentation. And then after that, she's gone. <laughs> so guys, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks so much for having me on. I hope you learned something. Let's do some Q and a, I'll help you out while I figure out how to put this link in the chat box. Yeah, guys, okay. drop any questions you have below, whether it has to do with flipping, raising capital, joint ventureships for Matt. And Matt, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule. I no know problem. you could be making money right now, <laughs> um, but you decided to spend your time here and help the audience out. And yeah. for the audience out there, you guys know I typically don't sell anything ever, but let me tell you, I'm like, I, I vouch, I, I, I will heavily vouch for the unlimited cash at the very least because that's the course that I've taken and it's made a tremendous um, difference in my real estate career, especially in terms of the social media game and pushing that on steroids, right? And you guys know me, like I host these events for uh, myself, Terry and Daniel, we host these events for free. We don't ask for anything in return. We have money coming out of our pocket for this. And typically we don't even sell anything, but let me tell you like that, that course has made a huge change in my real estate career. And I'm positive. If your goal is to raise capital, like you need to take that course. No lie. Like you need to take that course. Thanks man. Appreciate that. So I just dropped the link for the discount in the chat box. Like I said, it's only on for the time of this uh, webinar. When, as soon as we're done, that deal has gone, no longer available. So let's do some Q and A, let's talk, let's hang out. In the meantime, yeah, I do have uh, one, one person uh, actually messaged me, like DM'd me privately. And so the question they had was, uh, when it comes to your 30 day uh, deal where you look to make 25 to 30K, what type of renovation typically go on with those types of deals? Yeah, so those ones, like for my flips, they're almost all entirely cosmetic only. So I really avoid things like foundation repairs, um, you know, structural damage, if the floors are kind of like, you know, when you walk through your house and you're kind of walking like this, like I avoid those kind of houses, which is funny because like I'm a carpenter. You think I want to specialize in those. I avoid those like the plague. All I want to do is floors, paint, trims, bathroom, kitchen out. Like that's kind of my expertise. So whether it's a $20,000 flip or $50,000 bigger version of that, that's what I'm looking for all the time. I stay away from the big scary stuff. It's not worth it. For your burr properties, what's the age of the properties you're typically looking at? Uh, for the burrs, so it, that's a good point. In my area here in Kitchener-Waterloo, most of the properties were built after 1970s, but 1968, 1970. So our properties are a little newer-ish in, in my region. So that's kind of the properties that I, I know really well and specialize in. We still have the older homes like downtown Kitchener where 1940s, 1950s. I don't really like uh, flipping those houses or buying those houses at all. They got the rubble foundation, block foundation, you know, the problem, not be too wiring. So I kind of avoid those as well. So I look for, you know, 1965 and up. So do non-furnished homes, non-furnished uh, appliances are included, of course. Do they sell quicker than furnished ones? Do non-furnished houses with appliances sell quicker than furnished houses? Um, I've never sold a furnished house. I guess my market, I, because I'm selling to first time home buyers, I don't know, maybe they want to buy their own stuff. Um, yeah, I've never sold a, a furnished house. I stage it and I take it away <laughs> after the offer is firm, but and yeah. You use it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that could be a great uh, niche to specialize in, but I've never done it. Mm -hmm. uh, question, so you mentioned a lot of different strategies in terms of branding, right? All the way from your blog post to automation of emails, um, YouTube, Instagram. Yeah. If we were to, and I know you kind of, you need all of them in synergy to really get the maximum effect, but what would you say aside from YouTube, because we know that YouTube has been the most fruitful for you. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the second best social media platform or stra marketing strategy that you use that made a huge difference? To yeah. So the, the Instagram for sure. Instagram is number 200%. And like I said, especially the Insta stories, like the people following along your daily life without having for you to edit, you know, on a YouTube video, there's a lot of editing and whatnot. Instagram is like, literally, I'm making a smoothie. I pick up my phone here. I just take a shot of me making a smoothie. I'm walking through a house. I'm Hey guys, I'm checking out another house with my partner, right? I'm dropping that like that. It's so easy. You just upload it, upload it, done. So that's really, again, what makes money.
100%. Yeah, for a period of time, I was actually only using Instagram when I was starting off. And yeah. I, I, I guess I guess my thing was a bit different than yours because you already reached that financial independence level. But for me, it was all about the hustling, right? Yeah. And I attracted people who saw me hustling hard. And totally. No way in hell I'm putting in as much work as Austin, right? Totally. Yeah, yeah it's a I great know. strategy. If you're young and maybe you have only one or no properties, that's a great strategy to get, oh, I, I to get authority. Got a, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say I literally got off a call yesterday. Yeah, there's someone in the mid 30s was just like, the reason why I'm interested in partnering with you is because I see you hustle and you're younger than me. Mm -hmm. I don't I have a family? Um, I I'm not within the proximity of where I, that you're investing in. Yeah, I see you hustling hard and you're, you're younger. You have the energy, so let me partner with you, right? For sure. So, yeah, I mean, like putting the stories out there, you just never know what will come back to you. Yeah, hundred percent, totally. Um, do you got, if you guys, anyone own real estate in this, I personally don't own real estate in the States. Yeah, me either. You're all, you're all in NKWC, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Does anyone have any more questions below? When, okay. When you sell your rental properties, what are the top renovations you would do to make them more appealing? Okay. So the flooring is the easiest and most transformative. Second up is paint. And then you got your, the kitchen and bathrooms, obviously, is where you make the most amount of money. That's where people spend the most amount of time in a house is bathroom, kitchen. So you really want to spend money on those areas and maybe even a little more than what's uh, average in that area. We always want to make our renovations better than average. It's like, it's okay to overspend a little in order to guarantee that that house is going to sell. The worst thing you can do is have a flip that just sits and sits. It's going to make you go crazy. It's, <laughs> that's the worst feeling ever as a flipper. So that's why I go a little crazy on my flips. If I get the price I'm after, fantastic. If I get a little lower, big deal. At least it's sold in three days, right? So flooring is a big, big one that really changes the space. And then you got your kitchen and your, and your bathrooms. So let's actually dig into the KWC market a bit more. Um, so we actually had another question pop in. I'll get yeah. to that in a second. But with the KWC market, um, I know that it was ranked number two in Rain's best 10 top I think top 10 cities in Canada yeah. to invest in. So how, how has the appreciation in KWC uh, been like maybe like over the past five, six years or whatever the case yeah. is? Yeah. So it's been crazy. Just like everywhere else in Southwestern Ontario, we're talking eight to 12% depending on the neighborhood. The historically though, historically uh, Kitchener is 5% a year for the past 25 years. It's always oh, been 5% a year, which is boring. Just boring. Boom. Every five, every year, five, five, five. It's just boring. Right. But obviously the past couple of years is not uh, normal. <laughs> so, you know, a 12%, that's kind of what's going on, but don't expect that forever, right? Like that's unnatural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the minimum amount of capital one would need to partner with you or get into that market? Yeah, so why don't you just walk through an yeah. average deal? Yeah, so there's two properties that we do the most of. Number one is single family. So the nice, easy, boring, uh, semi-detached home or townhouse. That's what we do a lot of. That's about a hundred thousand. So, you know, we're buying those at uh, 400, 420. So 20% down is 80,000, 75,000, give or take around there. And then about 20,000 to renovate, closing costs, et cetera. So we're about a hundred thousand for the duplex conversion, which is the more popular one that I'm doing now with a lot of uh, partners. That's about 200 to 220,000 upfront. So we got to buy the house. The renovation to duplex it and convert it is about 120,000, 130,000. So we go again, we go pretty intense. We make it look really nice. But in it, that 220,000 is only for like three to four months. When we're done that, we refi it, right? And then we, my partners usually pull out about 100 grand. So they're usually into the deal for about 80 to 100 grand. Same as a single family, but we have a better property. You guys are probably like, you're still into the deal for money? Yes, we are. In Kitchener, that's a, that's a great slam. Does it get better than that? <laughs> we're not getting all of our money back like you would see in a Windsor or Sarnia or, you know, smaller town like that. So, so, uh, Catherine just said, I tried to buy your course. The link is not working. I put in my credit card info three times hmm. and it keeps going back to the home screen. Either I have nothing or I bought the course. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. I'll repost it here. Let me check yeah, it out. I'm going to be pushing your buttons a bit, but is it okay if we have that gat link expire by the morning? I yeah, for sure. For okay. sure. Okay. Yeah. Give some people a bit more time so they can get their questions in. Right I'll now. repost it here. If somebody else uh, had the same experience, let me know. That's weird. First time I've ever seen that. Uh, yeah. Refresh it later. Maybe try it. That'd be great. Okay, cool. 
Um, two, two, two. Let's let's go up to the. I think someone said he bought it and it worked fine. So I don't know. Refresh it, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so it's cool if uh, again I'm putting you on the spot. Is it cool yeah. if we have that link on until mm -hmm. maybe tomorrow morning or midday? For sure. Yeah. Well, okay. Cool. If you if you guys need it again, hit me up on uh, on Instagram. Hit up Austin. I'll give him the link as well. We'll get you the deal. <laughs> um. Do not. Oh, okay. Sorry. We answered that. Uh, blah blah blah. We answered that. What size of house do you typically buy for flipping? Very good question. Three or yeah. four beds. The si okay, so I always go for a three bed, ideally. I've done a few flips with two beds, like a downtown smaller war home, right? Those are okay, but I, I really shoot for a, a minimum of three. If I can get a four, like that's amazing. But a three is perfect because it really attracts the family or the young couple or the investor. It attracts everybody, right? So minimum three is a good question. Mm-hmm. Um, do you actually, the follow-up to that, do you actually find the more bedrooms it has, the more difficult it becomes to flip, right? Yeah. If we're talking, if the house is like five bedrooms or six, like it's, that's a big house or something. Yeah. So it gets a little harder and some people don't want that many bedrooms. So honestly, like if I had to choose, it'd be three to four bedrooms, four kind of being max. So if we start having five bedrooms where this was like a student property before, right? So it's, it's getting a little weird. <laughs> um, do you let your partners be involved in the process? Uh, I guess for a learning experience. Totally. So for the learning, so I call my partnership program essentially an apprenticeship program. You'll hear me call it that a lot. That's what it's for. So I, I literally handhold my partners through the whole thing. They walk through the renovations whenever they want. If I can't make it, Melissa, my project manager will walk you through. She'll tell you what's going on, why we're doing what we're doing, but I will definitely make time to meet you as much as I can. But yeah, we'll talk on the phone. Like you're going to learn a craft ton. Like I'm going to drag you through it. You're going to learn a ton. And what I found a lot with my partners is they use the first one with me, the apprenticeship as like a an apprenticeship. So they do the first one with me. They learn, they get comfortable. The second time they do it, they might hire me for the renovations only. So I offer that service as well, where I'll, I'll help you buy a property as a realtor. And then once you close on it, I'll bring in my team. We'll manage the renovation. And when we're done, we give you the keys back. You're on your own after that. So I've seen the progression. A lot of partners have done that partner, then the renovation with me. And then the third, fourth, fifth, they do it all on their own because they have the confidence. They have the team. Now they've got my team. They've learned how to do it. And now they're off to the races. Right? So yeah, use it as coaching for sure. Yeah. There are four ways to learn in real estate guys. The first one is you make your own mistakes, which could be costly, but it's also a great way to learn as well. Right? The second way is to work for someone completely free. Don't ask for anything in return. Yeah. And slowly as you progress through that, they're going to drop some golden nuggets throughout. The third way is hire a coach, right? Coaches are not cheap. You're looking at spending over 10 grand on a coach. Yeah. Or the fourth way is to JV with someone, safe route because someone who has experience and they teach you along the way, right? So pick your poison because there's not many other ways you can really get into the game. Yeah, for sure. Um... Would you consider buying lots or old houses in mature neighborhoods and flip them to an infill builder? Sure. Potentially. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm more into flipping houses in like 30 days and getting out and selling it to like an end buyer. But a hundred percent, like if we come across a good deal, but the house is like literally falling over, it's meant for like someone to knock it over and build it a hundred percent. Yeah. It's a great strategy as well. How do you feel about flipping a condo? Awesome. So super easy right? The condo company takes care of the outside. I don't got to worry about that. I just, it's, it's my world. Paint, floor, trim, kitchens out, right? That's, I love it. Yeah. Do you find it actually a bit difficult to get good condo deals? Yeah. In Kitchener, we don't really have condos like you would in Toronto with like towers and stuff like that. We have more uh, townhouse condos. So it's condo corporation. So yeah. So we have a lot of, we have a lot of those. We don't have very many like apartment uh, condos. Not yet. Maybe in 10 years we'll be more like that, but right now it's not really. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us a bit about your first project, your first yeah. real estate investment? First deal. Yeah. So my first deal, uh, said I was 22. It was a, a condo townhome. Perfect. <laughs> so super easy. That's why I bought it. I was young. I was just starting my renovation business. Um, yeah, I bought it for 135,000 bucks, uh, in 2012 and I'm actually selling it next week for, I'm hoping between 315, 320. And that was 10 years ago. So a double valuation almost, right? So more than, <laughs> so yeah, that was my first deal. Super easy. Yeah. I paint floor trim out. I did all the work myself. I spent, I think it was like 8,000 bucks on the whole house renovations. I did everything myself. Super easy stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if you guys have any more questions, drop it down below. I don't want to hold you up too long. No, man, well. it's good. It's good. Um, so we'll just give it like a, a couple more minutes and then we'll see if anyone has any, anything yeah. else to say. But um, yeah, I guess what, Matt, like walk me through some of your biggest mistakes you made in real estate investing. Um, you obviously had mm. the side of the expertise of construction because yeah. from that round. Um, but was there any, and it, and it seems like you did still end up getting screwed over by some contractors, but was that big, yeah. your biggest mistake or did you have some other yeah. hurdles? That, that was literally the biggest one. I haven't, you know, knock on wood, thankfully, I haven't really made any like major mistakes at all. They've been just dumb, stupid things that I've made mistakes on. But the biggest one would have been like hiring bad contractors that I knew right away, like this was not good. This contractor was not good. I did it anyway because I was desperate. Yeah, that was a big mistake. But we still made money. Like I, I've never lost money in real estate. Again, knock on wood. <laughs> Uh, not yet. I don't plan to. I never will. <laughs> yeah. And, and when you lose money in real estate, you just hold the long, like, exactly. As, as exactly. long as you hold, you're going to make it back up over the long term. That's why I've never made a mistake. I really like at all. Cause I just hold them. Right. Can't lose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So have you bought any foreclosure properties? Yes. Okay. So yep. what are your tips uh, for foreclosure? Yeah. So a couple of years ago, we were buying a lot of them because those were the only deals on MLS. And I didn't know about uh, wholesale marketing or anything like that. Like right now we have a whole wholesale business. I think my man Amar is still on here. He's my acquisition manager. So we're really building that side of the business right now to just demolish kitchen and we're taking over. So now we're looking at taking private deals. But back then, you know, 2013, 2014, I didn't even know about private deals. I don't think they were really that popular. So yeah, the deals I was getting on MLS were foreclosures. There was a few of them. Uh, yeah, they're the same process as buying a normal ha house off the market, put an offer in. You just have to sign a couple more forms because the banks have their own set of uh, schedules. That's it. That's the only difference. So, yeah. Cool. And uh, I'm just curious, like, how are your vacation plans? I know you always plan yeah. two or three a year. Clearly, yeah, sure. that's not happening this year, right? <laughs> oh, it is. It is. It is. No, okay. So, we were supposed to go to Norway. Uh, May 25th. So that sucks because we missed that one, obviously, but I'm planning, we're, we're going to plan Hawaii for a week in December. I hope those planes are going by December <laughs> and oh, then yeah. hopefully I, I think so. And then, uh, all of January, we're going to drive down to Miami with the dog. Me and Rachel, we're going to spend the month of January in Miami working from there, running the business from home. You know how it is. That's what I'm planning for. Oh man. That's so fucking dope. It looks nice. like a couple of people are actually having problem with the website. Don't worry, guys. You'll, I'm, I'm sure after we get off this, you'll yeah. get that fixed. Yeah. Hit me up on, on Instagram. I'll send you a different link, I guess. I'll, I'll help you out. Figure for it sure. out. Yeah. 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 Um, so any particular style of house you target, bungalow, ranch, two-story, which ones are more appealing to kind of your clients that you're looking for? Yeah. So the two stories are the most, um, actually it's not true. Like the bungalows, anything. The, the bungalows or the two stories are really popular in Kitchener. They, they sell really well. Do you do any wholesaling as a realtor? Kind of. So that, that's a gray area as a realtor. Yeah. You're totally allowed to. It's just a gray area. So for me, we, we flip all of our own deals. So in Kitchener, Waterloo, the market is pretty hot. It's, I assume it's not like Windsor or other areas where you can get a lot of deals. Kitchener is a hot market, just like Toronto is. So there's deals hundred percent, but I'm not getting a crap ton of them where I'm wholesaling them, but we have really the infrastructure to flip two to four houses a month. Like I can flip two to four houses a month. So I haven't found over that amount of deals yet, but if we do hundred percent, I'm selling to a client. I did kind of wholesale one to a client last week where I bought it. I closed on it with the intention of uh, flipping it, but we have five on the go right now. I was like, dude, I can't, we don't have time for this one. So I just sold it to a client as soon as I closed on it. So it's more of a whole tale, but yeah, for sure. You, you can, you can. For people that aren't really handy, what do you recommend them to do when figuring out what to renovate in a property and how do you properly communicate that to contractors? Very good question. Cause that's kind of what was going through my head when I first began real estate investing as well. Yeah. Like, like how to tell them the vision of the renovation that I want you're saying, or, um, yeah, I guess, how do you figure out what to renovate? Because I, I, maybe I'm butchering the question a bit, but I guess when I started off a contractor yeah. would say this, this, that, I'm like, yes, do yes, I yes. need to do that? Like, gotcha. how do you, yeah. as a new investor, how do you figure that out? And how do you, I, I guess, like, how do you communicate that to the contractor? Yeah, like, how do you say the vision? Yeah, so um, 
this is something that you have to know as a real estate investor. Um, you have to know what you kind of want. So at the beginning, it's gonna be a little weird. But again, if you, if you have a mentor or you partner with somebody, you're gonna know what you should renovate. Um, so it'll just come with learning. It'll come with time. But again, don't let the contractor push you around. Don't let them, you know, tell you what they want. Because a contractor will do that. Oh, we should do this. We should do that. We should do that. Because they want more money. You have to tell them, no, we're going to do this. We're only going to do that. Right? Is it feasible to do a flip or a private money when your bank account is near empty <laughs> and you can't really afford the holding costs? Or yeah. is your only recourse a JV? It's a JV, man. That's most likely the safest option. I don't want to be uh, stressing at night. I want to sleep at night like a baby. So yeah, get, get the money together before I do that. Hard money, private money, or partners is the best for sure. Yeah. Um, it worked for me. It should be sent to their email. Came in two minutes, so I have to wait a bit. Okay. Uh, looks like Caesar got charged twice. Okay, no problem. I mean, you'll get a refund right after this. Don't worry. Yeah. I'll help you with that. Yeah, we'll get you. Don't um, worry. Have you ever have you ever got into a bidding war? What's your strategy when there's a bidding war? Yeah, so I get in bidding wars all the time, literally almost every day when it comes to the buying holds. Remember, I'm buying the buying holds off of MLS. So the strategy is work backwards. If I know the duplex is going to be worth, again, bust up the calculator. If I know it's going to be worth 650K when I'm done, which is the duplex conversion here in Kitchener, and it's going to cost me 130 to, to convert, I'm going to take 650, subtract 130, I'll just do it with it live, right? Uh, 650, I'm gonna subtract 130. And then I want like at least like, at least a, a 30K equity uplift, subtract 30K more, right? My top offer is 490, which is exactly like what we're doing all the time. Like we're buying our duplex conversions for 490, 500. So the only stra strategy, it's not really a strategy, but what you have to do in a bidding war is what is your best price? That's where you have to go, period. What can you, what are you willing to pay for top? to be happy and not feel like crap after. And then the other thing is, can you go firm on the offer? You have to go firm. No conditions. Can't do it in, in a multiple offer situation. So have the partners lined up, get the money lined up, be serious. You want to invest in real estate? Let's go, right? Like, let's go. You got to be comfortable with doing that. 100%. Yeah. Um, Matt or Austin, how do you manage a renovation project from a distance? Have you ever done a flip or burr completely from your phone or your laptop? So I guess I can touch into yeah. that a bit just because uh, I'm investing down at Windsor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the answer is like relatively simple. It's just like building your power team, kind of what Matt was touching on at the beginning. Um, the tough part is, is that um, when you're further away, you're, the update you're going to get is less frequent, right? You can't be yeah. bothering someone every day. Yeah. But set the expectations right up front with the contractor. So use the tips Matt was talking about to interview the contractors, see their previous work, interview investors who have used them before, have an idea of how many projects they're cycling on. Because I have worked with uh, uh, and contractors who did two or three projects and man, my project took so so long it was frustrating yeah. so now i work with contractors who only work on one maybe absolute maximum it's a stretch but like two projects at a time yeah exactly um but yeah i just get video updates and, and walkthroughs from them and yeah. the worst like so i'm doing a duplex conversion right now and sabio uh he's an investor down at windsor who specializes in that right i've been trying to get the duplex conversion going but i'm so fucking frustrated with it yeah i'm just gonna hire him out like I'm going to, sure. I'm going to give him his like, whatever, eight, nine, 10 KP and let him do it. Right. Yeah. Um, similar thing. I, I, you offer that as well. Right. For like out of, out of town investors, if exactly, you don't want to yeah. deal with the renovation. For sure. Um, yeah. You, you, it's not free guys. Right. But what you have to justify is finding a better deal to, to kind of offset those additional costs you incur. Yeah, exactly. So it's the same thing for me. Like we, the only time I see the property is the very beginning when I do the video, the before video. And then at the end when it's done. So that's how I see it. And then my project manager, Melissa, also uh, goes every couple of days, but every Friday, typically, she'll give me a video walkthrough on WhatsApp and, and send it to me so I can see the project progressing. So yeah, I only go at the beginning and at the end. That's it. And then I take all the credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we do yeah. it very alike. Yeah. Having a phone and a laptop, you need to be able to do that shit. If you guys mm -hmm. can't do that, don't expect to retire and travel if you can't mm -hmm. manage from your cell phone or your laptop, right? Exactly, you right. Have to, you have to build up to yeah. that skill set. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just just get your video updates. Shit, like pay pay if you know an investor down there, pay them twenty bucks to visit the place for fifteen minutes, right? Yeah. Like 
things do, do cost money, you're taking their time. I'll For tell sure. someone to go down. I'll, like, I'll give you 25 bucks. Just give me a quick video walkthrough. Check these things off. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Now here's 20 bucks. At least I know what the progress is and I'm getting a second pair of eyes on it as well. Exactly. Um, do, do, do. Okay. I think we are all wrapped yeah. up with the questions. That was uh, good. Two hours, man. That was good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, really appreciate it. Matt, you dropped a shit ton of value. Yeah. Um, I know for me, you made a huge difference in my real estate journey. So thank awesome, you for man. that. Awesome. Uh, I'm sure that everyone here got a lot of value out of it. Yeah. Um, so where can people reach out to you if they want to get in contact with you? Yeah. So biggest, the easiest way is Instagram. I check it thousands of times a day. So if you want to hit me up, message me, uh, definitely follow me there. That's my day to day life. You'll get to see how I work as a real estate investor. If you guys want to hit me up about the course, hit me up there. If you have a problem with a couple of you having a problem here, hit me up there. We'll take care of you as well. Um, so that's the best spot. Uh, the best spot for my knowledge and stuff is YouTube. So go to my YouTube channel, the fruitful investor. I, we post two videos every single week. Every Monday is usually a property walkthrough because we're doing so many deals, which is fun. Every Thursday is a whiteboard video. So just, uh, just we're in school session on, on Thursday. So yeah, hit me up on those two platforms. That's where you, you should follow me. Yeah, again, really appreciate you taking uh, time out of your busy schedule and you guys for attending the event, sticking it through till the very end. Awesome, Hope you guys man. got a lot of value from it. Yeah. Um, sorry, one more question before we wrap yeah. it up. Do you guys recommend any software programs to manage everything? For me, it's WhatsApp. How about you? <laughs> yeah, same thing. Exact same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very simple. Very boring. N nothing fancy. Yeah, simple. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys, for tuning in. Uh, Matt, again, thank you for joining. Yeah, thanks, and uh, yeah, uh, until next time, man. Take care, guys. Awesome, man. See ya. Have a good one.